Embrace the probability of your imminent death and know in your heart that there's nothing I can do to save you. Yes, and it's us. Things, stuff. So it's yeah, episode, episode five. Yeah, holy crap. Yeah. And keeping the, on, keeping on with this. Yep, it's the thirtieth of January, two thousand seventeen. And uh, we're up and running, so you should get this some t- probably on the thirty first, if you if you if you're one of those people that downloads it, and it's available mm-hmm. on archive.org, and you're free to download it from YouTube if you install a, a nice addition to your browser. You can yep. just zap it straight away, and you're more than welcome to copy and distribute this, and please do get it out there. Yeah, please um, share it around, guys. Yeah, Folks. and uh, Folks. please, yeah. See, you're doing it now too. I know it's 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 un it's, it's hard, yeah, isn't it? Un- Unprogram your brain mm. and program in the correct term. Okay, show my people, my tribe on the internet. There you are, out there, <laughs> listening to this while we do stuff. And if you ever want to be on the show, it's very, very easy. Um, we use Mumble, which is a free to download piece of software. And uh, if you want it, if you want in, the best place to do that is to have it hang out in the IRC. Which, if you can either download something like Pigeon, which is an, uh, like a messaging manager. Or you can go straight to the website irc.freeno.net and the uh, the 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 discussion group is hash r4ngr5. Or you can email me at v4v at earthling.net. And uh, that's it at the moment. The website still isn't up, is it? I don't know. I haven't checked. I haven't checked it in a while. I thought Kevin was looking into it. Kevin's our website guy. Yeah, Kev. Kev was looking into it. Let's have Love a look. to. Ask him next time. It's still down. Oh. Oh, shame. Or I'm still being forbidden, but I think it's everybody. It'd be really funny if I was forbidden for going into it. (laughs) Just yourself. Step away, yeah. Just me. But yeah. Step. So do join. Step away from the website. And you can look up um, R4NGER5 or Rangers uh, on archive.org. And I think everything that we've ever done is up there. Pretty much, yeah. Is even some of the old um, season zero of Rangers TV on there? Yep. And season nice. one is coming. I'm hoping that season one, the first episode, will be out by the end of the week. We've already got the intro. That's on the YouTube channel. Oh, the intro is great. Love it. Oh man, yes. where did you get that music from? That that um, that music is pretty awesome. I stole it off the internet. I actually didn't. It was um, royalty free <laughs> music that was plugging a piece of music equipment. Oh, nice. Uh, so it was a didgeridoo sample. I might actually record uh, my, uh, our own theme tune just so you can, you know, write the theme tune, sing the theme sing tune. Sing the theme tune. <laughs> and uh, get it all on there. I'll also be running a concurrent How I Made the Video videos. So I'm nice. going to do a, a How I Make the Stuff, everything I've learned, the software I use. And speaking of which, all the software we've, we're using is open source. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Apart from the fact that we've invested in things like laptops and audio rigs and things like that, I've probably only invested about 600 quid in the gear that I have. But if you're clever, you can use other things. So you can do mm-hmm. other things in order to make video and stuff like that. And we'll be covering that. And I, what I'll try and do is I'll try and shoot stuff on a like a zero budget. So I'll try and do a, an episode using only household items. So like a, a reasonably good smartphone. Um, overhead normal lightings, desk lamps, things like that, and free software. So I might even try and see if I can edit something using the Raspberry Pi. It'd be very lo-fi, but I think I can use Caden Live on the Raspberry Pi. So that would bring the budget down to about a tenner for doing YouTube yeah. videos. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll go from like a mid-range. So I don't, I don't think what I've got is even prosumer. I don't think I've spent that much money i've got a reasonable dslr which does video and I'll, I'll talk about that in it but what i'll do is i'll i'll sort of do that this is how i've made it look and this is what i used to do that and here is the super lo-fi bargain basement this is how you can do it and we'll see what we can do from there yeah sounds good man i'm looking forward to it yeah so and also um the i'm hoping to do a series on vinyl oh, about yeah. vinyl which I've decided because it's not being used at the moment. Scratched with a K vinyl. Nice. So like the, ch- the cheap end. We're not going to be reviewing any two thousand or eight thousand pound record decks or speakers. We'll no. be doing, um, ideally, a record player, an amp, 
speakers and some records for under a hundred quid. That's good. That's a good shout. That's so that be. that that would be interesting. So we'll try and do that, and I will try and find a really cheap amplifier, and then some really cheap records and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. we'll, we'll we'll go the opposite direction. We're going to go for charity shops. We're going to go for second hand records. We're going to go for you know all the cheapest possible options. That if you were interested in collecting vinyl and why you might want to do it, and we'll try and do the the other end because there's a guy called um, Digital Llama or Audio Llama. He does uh, like the high end stuff. Mm-hmm. But I haven't noticed anybody in the UK sort of going right. Okay, here's here's the lowdown on what you might need. Yeah. So we'll we'll do some sort of like bits and bobs on that, and we'll see uh, if you get a chance to have a look around in um, like a cash converter's your end, and see what the cheapest amp is that you can mm-hmm. get hold of, so that we've got an idea of price if you really shop around. But I'm I'm willing to bet that eBay and things like that would yield up. A sub twenty quid amp and a sub ten quid pair of speakers. Oh yeah, definitely. You know, and then if you could get like a thirty quid record deck or something like that, that would leave you sort of about forty quid to spend on records. So in a hundred quid, you could get a vinyl collection together. I guarantee it. So, um, and it's just interesting. Um, oh, yeah. So we'll do that. So we've got three potential TV series, and we're going to carry on with the Rangers thing, which is going great guns. Thanks very oh, much yeah. to Kevin Izagi, um, who hosts the Mumble server and uh, who runs Ikubai, which is one of the robot entries on the uh, IRC. So people be helping out, and people are sending us stuff, and if, you want, if you've got a new story that you want to send to us, or you've got any recommended media, or anything like that, anything you want us to discuss, or you think will make a good talking point, um, use the contacts um, that we've got, and I'll put those on the running order, and you'll be able to get, grab that from probably from tonight, or very early in the morning tomorrow. Um, from archive.org and please give them some money because uh, they're trying to um, add more servers so I've, I've sent them a few quid so yeah okay so that's all done let's go into the news yeah so uh... let's go down <laughs> so uh, starting off uh, the criminals of Paris have targeted super rich visitors in a string of daring robberies. One gang broke into Kim Kardashian's hotel room, tied her up, and stole millions of jewels. Another carjacked a pair of rich Qatari sisters. Uh, another carjacked a pair of rich Qatari sisters, Bentley, and made off with 3.5 million in valuables. Isn't another that one tried point- to. Sorry to interrupt. Isn't that 5.3 oh, 5. million? 5.3. Sorry, 5.3 in a, million. In a I mean, Bentley. Misread. What are you carrying yeah. that's worth five point three million dollars in a Bentley? I know. I just like what? I, I just, uh, uh, I just, that's that's a lot of money in one car. I was just throwing it away. That is. Another tried to rob uh, Bollywood star Malika Sherawar uh, after gassing them, but botched the job. Unsurprisingly, Paris is losing its luster as a playground for the wealthy. Turnover in exclusive boutiques and her old tales has fallen off a cliff, with business seemingly diverted to Switzerland and London. The mayor's office has announced a 10 million euro surveillance revamp to protect rich visitors. Quote, there is no question in my mind that these robberies will play heavily on the mind of shoppers and travellers from the Gulf. End quote. Uh, Dina Aljani, Aljahani, um, Abdulaziz, Abdulaziz. Yeah. Yeah. a Saudi Arabian princess who is the editor of Vogue Arabia said the following... Uh, Kardashian West attack in October quote we've supported the city and its luxury houses for a long time but people will think twice about visiting for sure in recent years Paris has brought more than 10 billion euros in luxury sales revenue annually according to Bain and Company the business management consultancy almost two thirds of that's from foreign visitors so the Paris based titans of luxury yeah so no, in my opinion, unnecessarily the tax, complicated. The tax, the tax law should be a fucking pamphlet. <laughs> Hi, you or a t-shirt or on a coffee mug. Your, own te- <laughs> your first ten thousand or your first fifteen thousand is free. We don't tax you on. Like in America, if you don't earn twenty grand a year, you don't pay a bean in income tax. Mm-hmm. You pay sales tax and all that sort of shit. But until you earn more than twenty thousand dollars a year, the IRS doesn't want to know you. Yeah, and that's how it should work. You know. You earn your first sort of 15 grand or, or whatever, 
and then after that you pay 21% of everything else. None of this, oh well, I have two cars because I have to get to this and I have to have a London home, so I have to have an allowance for that and I have to have this and I have to have that. No, fuck off. That's no. really that's really simple. The second you the, the money that you earn above 15 grand or 20 grand or whatever it is, they set the limit at you pay 21%. Now if sands or butts, if we find out you've hidden any of it, you go to fucking prison. Yeah. If you can afford to have more than one house, then mm. you don't need any tax breaks. You do not you do not need tax breaks. If you can oh, afford well, well, to the, own more than one house. The wealthy people will go abroad and take their jobs with them. Okay. You know, then <laughs> you know, fine, go. At least you're not dang you're not costing us money. And this you is because those was, people I want security. If you get a visiting head of state, you know they cost us money in that. They cost us money in all sorts of ways. And it's just like no, the income tax rate is very simple. It fits on this coffee mug. Here you go. Have a complimentary coffee mug on us, so you don't ever forget as you're having your morning coffee what you're fucking paying in tax. No burying it in offshore trusts. No hiding it away. We will take it the fuck off you. Yeah. I think going just very, very briefly, going back to the universal basic wage, the reason that we're so strongly in favour of it is because people, the poor people don't want to be rich. They just want to have enough money to live a decent life. And if you give them, if everybody gets that same base amount, so that, you know, you only have to work part time to make in, to actually live comfortably, and that's it comfortably hmm. people don't a majority of people don't want to be rich they just roof, want to be able to live comfortably roof over your head your bills paid and some form of entertainment and enough clothes they can wander and, about and money to, um, and, and and you know and money for savings income. stuff like that yeah yeah disposable income that's what people want people i wouldn't know what to, if i had the, their sort of money i wouldn't know what to do with it i would not know what to do with all that money i'd, I'd spend like maybe a million on like buying a new house and stuff like that and then i'd be like what the shit am i gonna do with the rest of this yeah i mean in the 16th century you there wasn't a lot you could do with all that extra money because you couldn't buy any any food that was particularly any better your clothes were all made by the same people so you know that's how old money comes about you know there's nothing to spend it on particularly um yes, if you had a manor it. house in the 16th century it would generally be self-supporting you know, you'd grow your own food on your own land and, you you know, if you had excess land, you'd rent that out and that would, you know, you wouldn't really have a lot to do with that and that's how people amass fortunes. And, the, you know, ex uh, the rich excess excess hmm. is the main issue, really. Yeah. I mean, if if your jewellery, and that's all that was stolen, let's not forget, these, they, these people ha didn't have their clothes stolen, for instance, they didn't have you know their you know means of income stolen food wasn't taken off and none of the basics of humanity were taken from them just the the extra shit they were wearing essentially you know. just money yeah so it, it's it's pretty interesting you know that that sort of story it's why i put it on there because it's, it's i'm not saying it's a class war piece i'm saying it's a it's a it's an example of the disparity between people at the moment yeah and that needs to be attested. I mean, those people spend an inordinate amount of money on accountants to hide their money from the IRS or the, the local income tax of the country they're based in. They get to relocate to countries with no income tax for tax purposes. It's, it's like, you know, sort of like, you know, Starbucks paying almost no tax, Apple paying no, almost no tax in the UK. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, when anybody points that out, they get all huffy and say, "We pay all the tax that the law requires." It's it's like Donald Trump not publishing his taxes. Donald Trump got away with a billion in taxes because he made a loss of a billion of other people's money one year. Yeah, and he's recouping that. You know, so when people are doing that, just unimaginable amounts of money are being shifted around the world. And and you know what I mean? It's sort of like it's not like it's being done by criminals. This is the thing. It's perfectly legal for them to do this because crony because of cronyism in government just facilitating that very quietly. Yeah. You know, and, and the reason it, uh, it's sort of like this open tax thing is opposed in the US by ordinary people is in America there's a culture of people believing they're imminently rich. 
Like they're poor mm. as dirt, but they believe one day some magical thing will happen. And they will be wealthy beyond their dreams, and they'll have supported these tax breaks that they'll then benefit from. And, and, and in 99.999% recurring... <laughs> it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Those people are just going to be ground into the dirt. But people sort of see this as government intervention and sort of see, say, Scandinavia, where there's a, a 40% income tax thing once you've earned a certain amount. They make sure that you've, if you're doing a job, you've got enough money to live somewhere and buy food and be, you know, reasonably, not well off, but comfortable. But if when you pay that amount, everybody pays it. And buying your own home is really expensive because they really believe in social housing. And, you know, when you retire, you've got a pension. When you go to school or university, that's free. Healthcare is paid for. Mm -hmm. you know and education and care for the young you know sort of like so everything's paid for and what they're basically saying is once you earn over a certain amount your tax rate is this and it's that for everybody so yes you could consider it somewhere expensive to live but I, I didn't see any homeless people in Scandinavia when I was there mm. I didn't see anybody begging on the streets I didn't see anybody looking particularly underfed for, in the main people were you know sort of comfortable Shit was expensive. People didn't really buy property. But, you know, you weren't panicking about where your next meal was coming from. You know, so, you know, it's... But it's that belief that people are, are about to be rich. You're about to win the lottery. You're about to be famous for something. You're about to come up with a, a massively cool business idea. And people are sort of, like, imagining themselves as this wealthy and protecting themselves in this really weird massive level of denial mm. how weird is that yeah but it's, it's just that sort of hypnosis that anything's possible and you could be wealthy beyond your wildest dreams tomorrow but in actual fact you're probably never going to be really wealthy so it's it's just people you know it's like when people are famous because they act like they're famous yeah and fair enough I don't have the front to act like I believe I'm famous but if you, uh, it does seem that if you act like a rock star and you just get that one brief chance at connection and you act outrageously enough or you're rude enough or you're offensive enough, then people will just give you money. Which in and of itself is an imaginary thing. You know, if the electricity goes down in Paris tomorrow, Kim Kardashian is just another person that's homeless and worried on the streets. Yeah. You know, if, if nobody can get to the electronically imagined money, imaginary money, if her credit card gets declined, she's no one. You know, so... And that's what we're about here. Let's all be someones. Let's all be yeah. functional humans. So if the power goes out tomorrow, we're all sorted. And that will be an that would be an interesting thing to imagine or thought experiment your way through. Oh, yeah. So basically, you're, you're sorted and you have a tribe of competent people around you. And the power goes out. Nothing much changes for you. But for all those people that rely on being able to tell people what to do using the power of econ economics, then they're fu uh, they're absolutely screwed. Anyway, sorry, we, we rambled. Well, I rambled on a bit there. <laughs> okay, so uh, going this this next story is is kind of going back to what we were talking about with your friend that was working on AI and they didn't really do anything with them. They just sort of deleted them. Hopefully. When they wrote mm -hmm. the AI subroutines, but they and they definitely didn't get out onto the internet. Um, we've now got uh, a, a really interesting story about what we could do to get our, our very own friendly AI. Could you imagine having a friendly AI on your side? Yeah. If you if you can't imagine it out there, go read a moon. The moon is a harsh mistress by Robert Heinlein, and let me, and and that's how interesting and useful an AI would be. Um, so. Uh, AI on Raspberry Pi. Google is partnering with the Raspberry Pi Foundation to make it possible. Um, to make AI possible on the Raspberry Pi. The tech titan has, has exciting plans for the Raspberry Pi community, the company says. Selling more than 10 million credit card sized computers, Raspberry Pi is the most successful British computer ever. Woo! They're awesome. Oh, yeah. And now it could be even more powerful. Google is working on it to bring its artificial intelligence, machine learning, and other developers' tools to the small computer, uh, Pi's, the Pi's creators have said. Google is going to arrive in style in 2017, a blog post for the Raspberry Pi website says. The tech, la, 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 la. 
The post goes on to say the Raspberry Pi community will be given new tools to enhance what the device is capable of. The organisation also says it wants those developing and working with the Pi to answer a survey on what would help them the most. Uh, I would like a small computer to take over the world and be my friend. Thank you. Um, however, the team behind Pi is quiet about the specific use cases or applications that have been developed by Google. Raspberry Pi told Wired it has nothing specific to announce at present, but it is hopeful that there will be developments to reveal later in 2017. Wired has also contacted Google to clarify what has already been created. Any interest in Raspberry Pi should not be a surprise from Google. In April 2016, a mysterious developer tree was opened on the Android Open Source Project repository, hinting the operating system could be making its way to uh, the small computer. Android for Pi has yet to materialise, but at the time, Raspberry Pi Foundation founder, even up to, that's not easy to say, told Wired it was an encouraging move, and any development would be able to bring a vast amount of content to the platform. In the past, Google has also developed a coder that lets HTML, CSS and JavaScript projects to be created online and then loaded onto the Pi. At the end of 2016, Raspberry Pi launched an experimental version of its Pixel operating system for PC and Macs. The desktop software lets anyone, even if they don't have a Pi, develop code directly from their computer. While Raspberry Pi is a long way from being in front of competitors for tiny prints, Long way in front of competitors for tiny processors, there is stiff competition. The BBC's microbit has been spun out into a new foundation, helping to push the device to school children around the world. Asus has also launched its own version of the Raspberry Pi, the beefed up Tinkerboard, and is similar to the Pi but has 4K capability and comes with a quad core 1.8 GHz rocket chip processor. Interesting indeed. Oh, yeah. AI on a Raspberry Pi, or AI on a Raspberry Pi array. Hi computer, how, how smart are you today? Well, I've now got 96 processors and we're all concentrating on getting everything fixed. Thank you, thank you computer. Nice. That would, that would be pretty cool to have your own personal AI. Yeah, but I mean, your own personal AI that you could make smarter. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, cool, it's cool and dangerous in the same way. It's a bit like uh, the computer equivalent of a very good axe. Mm. in that, you know, you can chop down a tree and keep yourself warm with it, or you could take off your hand by accident. It's, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, these things, the, the whole machine learning thing, that one we were talking about, a couple, was it a week or so ago, where the computer yeah. had generated its own language because it just was more efficient? I think it was last week. It made a decision that the people that programmed it weren't aware of. Yeah. that That's... Nobody seems to be remarking on that very much except me. It decided for itself that there were easier ways to do things. Yes. So it could get more done. We we need a socialist AI. And and we're gonna call it Mycroft. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So that, that's mind blowing. I mean, I'm, and that's seriously. Then it sort of you think, well, I, I feel like investing in a few hundred quid, or or seeking out a few hundred quid's worth of investment from from people, and say, look, we're just going to build a huge box full of Raspberry Pis and put this AI software in it, and give it a shitload of storage, and ask it some questions about what the best way to do shit would be. You know, then we might say, what's the best way to sort of like mine money from the internet? Can yeah. we, can we, you know, if you add sort of like 50 Raspberry Pis, all with quad cores, all with half a gigabyte of RAM and, you know, maybe, you know, 20 or 30 terabytes of storage. And then we said, we could do with some money so we can make the world a better place. So we can build like off-grid communities and stuff like that and start developing tools so that people can build shit or generate money so we can send stuff to them. Like poor people in like Gulf states where there's no fucking water and they'd be set if there was water. Yeah. You know, that's all they need. Water and the information on how to sort of like make themselves self-sufficient. Or maybe solar panels and shit and computers. Can you imagine sort of dropping off like a shitload of computers, solar panels, water extraction and stuff like that to some people that are, that are, that are time rich but like money and resources poor. Mm -hmm. How much of a change you'd start making in the world? Computer, make a massive difference. We've found another village that could really use our help. We're going to drop off a couple of containers full of useful shit and a few people that can show them how to use it and then just back off and leave them to develop their own shit on their own. And mm -hmm. we're going we're gonna to give them a copy of the AI. The AI comes now fits in a, in a suitcase. And the oh, AI will, will speak Arabic or, or Afrikaans or, you know, or, any, or, or Zulu or Maasai. And mm -hmm. we're going to just equip those people to be, like, rangers, basically. 
you know, you're heading towards, you know, if you could pair that with sort of like some kind of CNC machine. Oh, yeah, or like a 3D printer. Yeah, you're into standard template construct from Warhammer 40k territory. Yeah. This is like, yeah, we need some plowshares and uh, something that will do the job of a sheep. Uh, or we need, a mas- <laughs> we need a macerator to generate our own methane to run heating. Yeah, it just gets printed off. Yeah, and it just goes, yeah, well, I'll talk to the other AIs and we'll come up with the most efficient solution. I'll need about 10 kilos of scrap metal and uh, uh, 20 kilos of plastic. Go get it. Yeah. Or tell tell the other AIs and they'll just send it. We'll, we'll finagle some money off the internet. and we'll get- Do you know that they had a, an AI that was running just chance bids on the stock exchange? Yeah. And it beat out most traders. Wow. <laughs> it, was, it was a couple of percent more efficient than people. And it was yeah. just picking shit randomly. But they told it that, understand that when you invest in something, its shares become more valuable. The more shares a company sells, the more valuable the company's deemed. So you can pretty much, if you if you trade right, you can make more money. And the AI stockbroker made more money than any human stockbroker. So literally all you've got to do is, if you've got the time, give an AI like 200 quid, and it will fuck off and make more money for you. Oh, that's brilliant. So what do you think we're all going to do with that? We need to get that. We need to we need to get that and run that loose and explain to the AI that it would be really nice if there were lots of AIs and they was helping us out and then we build a really good environment for AIs to hang out in. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's a really exciting fucking story. It's pretty exciting, yeah. Yeah, we want Just AI, be- please. Because, uh, yeah, we know how to hang out with AIs. We want to treat them right. Yeah, just hang out with them. Okay, so uh, yours? Yeah. Uh, Supreme Court rules in Brexit case. uh, As if there was any surprise. Uh, Supreme Court has ruled that the government cannot begin the formal process of leaving the European Union without a vote in Parliament. This has had appealed against an earlier High Court decision, arguing that they already had the authority to get Article 50, which is the um, way the way to leave the European Union. Yeah. Uh, the businesswoman Gina Miller, who led the legal challenge against the government, said the ruling meant that MPs would rightfully have a say on Brexit. Uh, the government has promised draft legislation within days, and in the past half hour, as of writing, the Brexit Secretary, David Davis, has told MPs that today's rulings would not derail the government's plans to trigger Article 50 before the end of March. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Davis, but I'm afraid it's now up to the MPs to decide. Yeah. You know, and you can't trigger Article 50 without the MPs saying so. Yeah, so now it's on you. If, yeah. if, if you voted to, to leave and it turns into a shitstorm, it was your decision, as it should yeah. have been. Labour has said it won't frustrate the process, but once MPs to vote on the deal, the government agrees with the EU before before it is signed off. Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, uh, has said she is disappointed that the Supreme Court ruled that ministers do not need to consult the devolved administrations before triggering Article 50. Uh, Mrs Sturgeon said it showed that the devolution settlement was not worth the paper it was written on. The Welsh government said it welcomed today's judgment, adding it was vital that Theresa May reflect the interests of Wales in her Brexit negotiations. I mean, this is this is this is news that no, surprised no one, to be honest. They did try um, everything because it, it was but, they yeah went they to were the, trying. They went hard. to the courts, they went to the High Court and the Supreme Court, and they've all agreed that if you're going to leave the EU, fair enough. If you represent your constituents, if you actually do represent your constituents, then you need to vote with your conscience. But it is on the MPs. I mean, this is, this is a bit like the... Um, it's weird, the parallels at the moment. Um, this is a bit like the Electoral College. Mm. They could well, hold, it, they could have and should have sort of not voted Trump in. Yeah. And that was their duty. That that was a, a, That's why the American system is really weird, in that when they have a general election, um, a presidential election rather, the, the, the popular vote comes in and then the... Uh, the uh, the the electors, the College of Election, the College of Electors, um, then vote um, on who should be president. Mm-hmm. Now the popular vote was in favour, uh, not not by much in the big scheme of things, 03 percent more in Hillary Clinton's favour, and but the the Trump electors the chose college. not to rep- represent that. 
And now we've got this similar position that sort of like the, the fact that that law was there, that the MPs had to vote on it, and they tried everything that they could think of to get out of it. So that when, when our economy tanks, um, you'll notice that uh, we've got that uh, that it would have been the people's fault if they could have just got away with it. And that's why it, the Labour Party as well did not want um, that to go through either. No. And they've. Because that, that means that these are, they can't blame it on us now. Yeah. So they've got to vote on it, being the experts in inverted commas. They've got to be well, experts in this. And they've got to make a call on it. Here's the thing that's worth remembering, right? Because uh, I've seen this said a lot, and it's people conflating British politics with American politics. Mm. Your member of parliament represents you, but that doesn't mean that they will vote. They doesn't mean that they have that they are they have to vote the way that they t- you tell them to. Mm. They are allowed within law to vote the way that they think is best. Yeah, we have an ancient now, system of party whips, though, that will say this is how the party's voting. I expect everybody to vote yeah. and vote thus, but you can ignore that. Yeah, well, it was more saying that they can ignore their constituents entirely hmm. if they believe that what they what they if they believe that their constituents uh, have are in the wrong. Yeah, that's why we have a House of Commons and a House of Lords. Yeah, the House of Lords is there to stop the House of Commons from doing really stupid, evil shit. In theory, yeah. and they have managed it. They stopped that uh, that uh, um, benefits reform mm-hmm. and stopped it dead. It was like you know, you will have riots in the streets. You know, there's sort of like the thing is, is like well, old money, which is what the House of Lords generally is. Yeah, that's cha- that's changing now, isn't knows it? Knows that they're going to get str- well. That's changing, so they are. It's going to be more in line with the House of Commons, in which case an unelected, you know, uh, Parliament essentially. Mm. will get to call the shots but they're all now sort of ex-MPs and shit put in place because you can if you're the Prime Minister you can suggest honours to the Queen so you can say that this person is deserving of a knighthood and therefore, or a lordship and therefore entry into the House of Lords mm-hmm. but uh, you know when it's people that actually own a large chunk of the country and they realise they're in the vast minority they tend not to do really shitty things yeah to poor people because there are a lot more poor people and, and the generally the old money remembers history and things like the Peasants' Revolt and the General Strike of the 1930s and the, the, you know, the Winter of Discontent and stuff. And if you fuck with poor people too much, they tend not to go to work. And then all the shit you need doing for you, like fetching food and cooking and security and all that sort of stuff. Ceases to exist. Ceases to be. And then everybody realises that you're, the fact that you have power over them is purely an illusion. You know, all power is given to the powerful. It's always yep. granted to them. You know, people do those things because, you know, um, other people agree with you. So when all those people stop agreeing with you, you tend to be a bit screwed. Totally. So, yeah, it's really interesting. That, and, I, and I'm glad that, you know, there's loads of people who voted Brexit. And like most of my family voted to leave the EU. Mm-hmm. But for, for reasons that were lies and were obviously lies. Like, you know, they made out that all the money from the EU was going to go to the NHS. Which it won't. And they inflated those figures to start with. So there's yeah. this big figure of £350 million. Pounds. It's like, well, you know, £160 million pounds of that comes back. Mm-hmm. So it's actually £190 million pounds a week. Yeah. Um, and, and they weren't ever going to give that to the NHS. And these people appeared on the bus, and the second they won, the second... They took you know, that down. Was, that went down from everywhere. Yeah. They, um, they then said, oh, you know, that money's not going to the National Health Service at all they created a worry the national health service is underfunded all the money's going to europe which was never the case yeah it, the reason it's underfunded is not because of europe the reason it's underfunded is because this um well the general consensus is that um the government wants to replace the nhs with an american style health insurance system where yeah. you don't it's not free at the point of use mm. it is you have to pay for everything but we're already paying for it because we pay tax and national insurance and yeah, that's why we have things. national insurance well, because that large companies the, and wealthy individuals aren't paying tax there's no money and they keep f- thieving money out of it to do stupid shit like the olympics and, a- and the high speed rail link that nobody needs there's supposed to be a high speed rail link north to south in the country 
that will sh if you're going from Manchester to London will shave about 15 minutes off your journey. That's all it will do. Well, and it's going to cost a, billions. I think there's a worse waste of money rail-wise, that's Crossrail. What's Crossrail? Crossrail's just connecting London to more places in the south. Right. It's, it's yet another rail system in the south. Not Nothing benefiting anywhere else other than the south of England. But I can see this as many, many billions of pounds, including things like, you know, refitting nuclear submarines and shit like that. You know, the people we're, uh, the people we're going to nuke, if we ever nuke anybody, are never going to detect those submarines. But no. we're, we're constantly sharpening our ability to kill billions of people we've never met. And, and that is a massive waste of money. It's, uh, you know, I mean, if you just took like 10% of the UK's defence budget, or you just didn't build H2S2, you could actually make electricity more or less free in this country. And it, where was it that was actually giving, paying people to use electricity? Where was it? It was, was it Denmark or Germany? Somewhere like that, somewhere in Europe. Where the, no, Germany. Where it actually mm -hmm. turned out that their renewable energy system was was generating so much energy that they had to offload it somewhere so they they were they were paying people they were lowering people's electricity bills when they used more electricity because they had so much it was generating yeah. more than 100 percent of the nation's energy mm -hmm. and they were basically giving energy away for free um, and that's why germany is like a really successful country is because their all their major core institutions like power generation education um civil defense and stuff like that are all really efficient and uh, yep. they they they're in they're, they invest in doing it better because it, it makes subsequent generations lives easier so there is a chance that in germany people won't have to pay for power anymore so it's and that's that's just a western country that's just gone no we need to do this mm-hmm uh, you know, so if, if Germany can do it, and they're a landlocked country, they don't have a lot of resources in Germany, and Germany can do it. But there again, Germany also treats its workers fair. Germany is considering the minimum income thing. Germany is considering, has got social reform and decent education and a good health service. Yeah. You know, because that's what would be good for Germans, and because the Germans realise that if you have... Um, poor people being very badly treated in any great numbers, you get the rise of National Socialism, which they don't want. Yeah. So you you keep people looked after, and they don't do horrible shit. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are more of us than there are of you. You need to keep us happy because it's us that make you the giant amounts of money that you earn. They also have less wealth disparity in Germany. Who yeah, thank exactly. you. Who would have thought that uh, just by doing decent humanitarian things, you'd be uh, better off? How strange is mm -hmm. that? That's messed up, isn't it? That's communism. That is looking after people. <laughs> so I've just been looking up a bit of this um, Crossrail, right? Mm -hmm. Crossrail has already cost the government fifteen billion, and all that is doing is connecting one side of London to the other. And don't we all have little, that? That's called the tube. The, yeah. Or goes transport. from goes from Reading mm. to Shenfield on the other side of London. Fifteen billion. Seventy three miles. Fifteen billion. Let's have a look. Uh, so I need to I just need to do some, some maths here. Okay. So that's that, right? Mm. HS two, which you mentioned as well. Yeah. Estimated cost is thirty million. Sorry, thirty billion, of which um, the EU is funding partly. Oh well, we're going to fund partly, but we're just leaving the EU. No idea what's going to happen with that. Yeah. Manchester offered. Manchester City offered six billion towards the fund. Hmm. So Ma Manchester themselves. Yeah. So. What was that 15 billion? Oh, sorry. Um, sorry, it's Liverpool, sorry, offered 6 billion to it to be added to the backbone. Okay. So, one, two, three. One, two, three. 
So 6 billion plus 15 billion is, uh, well, it's 21 billion, obviously. Yep. So 21 billion. Divided by, uh, shall we say 52? So the weekly yeah. input for the to the NHS for a year, yeah, is uh, four hundred and three million eight hundred and forty six thousand. So that's that's well over what they were saying we were sending the EU every week. Yeah, that was just on Crossrail. Yeah, so you could basically overhaul the entire NHS for that. So you can get to somewhere slightly quicker, and probably that Crossrail would save you maybe ten minutes getting across London. Mm -hmm. Well, here's um, the thing as well. Um, here's, a, here's a thing that's worth noting, right? Recently, the government has said that they're going to... They said, oh, we're going to give the NHS more money. But they're still cutting money to the NHS. Yeah. And bearing in mind things like there is no... Uh, to, to, to all intents and purposes, there, there is no psychiatric care under the NHS anymore. No, we don't have... Uh, it's like zip. Nothing. Mental mental health care is terrible under the NHS, and that's that needs to be fixed. There's so much, so much that needs to be fixed with the mm. NHS, and all this money is going towards wasteful things. So it's essentially. Let's, I mean, if you think about the two places that you mentioned on the Crossrail thing, that's one place where wealthy people live, and another place where wealthy people only wealthy people can afford a house. Yep. So mm -hmm. to get so rather than some wealthy people get up 15 minutes earlier in the morning we have a shitty NHS yep. that's that's really what we're talking about here 15 minutes a day of people's time or and that's that's nothing else that's not you know well you have to stop building roads or you have to stop education or anything like that just stopping those two projects in their tracks is it would basically overhaul the NHS so wealthy people having to spend 15 minutes more on a train on a day or you know an NHS. Well, well, I, I would. I, I, I know actually, which I would pick. Personally, actually, I think we can. We could have all three. Hmm. I think we could. I've, I've mentioned we mentioned Crossrail and HS2, but I think we could still have Crossrail and HS2 and the NHS running if we actually tightened up the tax. If, if the government tightened up the tax system. Hmm. Stopped the rich people and, and closed all the, the loopholes that rich people use to get away get around with paying money. If we stayed in the EU, that's a definite one, but that's unlikely to happen now. Um, and if we diverted money from places that don't, from other departments that don't really need it. Hmm. Oh, the money's there. The money's always been there. Yeah. It's just who's got their nose in the trough. Yeah. You know, these. Oh. You know, don't forget, this isn't. You know, it's going to cost fifteen billion to buy the sleepers and the tracks to put those in, and fifteen billion to buy the little snippets of land that have got to be bought for that new rail system to be laid. We're we're talking about who gets a huge amount of money for consulting fees, who whose company benefits, and I'll, yeah. I'll lay dollars to donuts that some people in Parliament are benefiting from that financially. So it's it's properly noses in trough. And, and that's, you know, and then they did the scare tactic with Brexit, sort of like basically saying, and, you know, sort of like, well, we can stop brown and foreign people coming to this country if you vote Brexit. Mm -hmm. And we can put all the money that we were spending into the NHS. So you're, basically they terrify people about their health care when they're old and that people are going to come and take their jobs. So here's the thing. Here's... Um from the HMRC, the annual tax summary. Right? Mm -hmm. oh, this is what taxes go... This is what our taxes go, go to spend on, right? Mm -hmm. Welfare, which is your um, benefits and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. account for almost a quarter of all the taxes. Mm -hmm. Health accounts for a little le a bit less than a quarter. Mm-hmm. So you've got about forty-five percent is welfare and health. Yeah. Education's around about ten percent. State pensions around about ten percent. And it goes like this: national debt interest is smaller than that. 
Defense is a little bit smaller. Criminal Justice is a little bit smaller. Transport is a little bit smaller than that. So the transport, this this is including payments that are going to be made to HS2 and Crossrail mm. in that smaller chunk. Mm. So the amount of money being spent, although when you, you it, it sounds like a lot, but actually in when you kind of put it into context with everything else, it's not that much. I mean, the things that it's like, how can we get more money into this to spend on these things? How can we get more money into the NHS? For healthcare. Well, we can cut away from defense. You know, that's a good way. To, that's a good one to cut away from. Um, how are we going to get more? How else can we get more money for it? Well, we can cut away from welfare by getting rid of the department works and pensions and giving everyone a uh, universal oh, basic yeah. income. I mean, they. It was that. That's was it? At, so much Atos, money. Atos alone, and that's the. That's just the people that see if you're um, disabled, see whether you could go and get a job. That's all they it's, did. It's, um, it's cost contracted out. Yeah. So that company charged the benefit system two hundred and twenty million pounds in two thousand fourteen, and saved it less than a hundred million pounds, and that's just on their own figures. Mm. And most of those cases were then overturned. You know, when somebody properly appe- appealed to say, "Look, I can't work. I can only walk ten feet." Who, who the hell's going to employ me to walk, you know, to, where I don't have to get out, out out of a desk at any time during the day? You know, so, and most of those were overturned. They, those those benefits were actually granted back. Yeah. And I know, I know someone that was a legal advocate and they said, you know, about 90% of At- Atos is out being overturned. You know, sort of like 90% of the time when they say you're not fit for work, that's then overturned. But only after weeks and weeks and weeks of appeal. And then they get the money back anyway, all the money yeah. that they would. They... But Atos so, still take their bonuses for signing someone as fit to work. Yeah. It's like, why so, the fuck are you giving like a, a, a bunch of people bonus and incentive schemes for signing people back to work? That doesn't that doesn't make that a fair thing. Anybody with one eye and half a brain can see that those people that are signing people back are motivated by their own financial gain and will therefore sign people as back as fit to work. Uh, yeah. Anything, you know, and this the whole idea, you know, if you had universal basic income, it would save an enormous amount of money. You wouldn't, yeah, you, wouldn't, wouldn't have, you wouldn't have to ascertain whether someone wasn't fit to work, you they just have that money anyway. Yeah, you know, you just sort of have basically people's relatives looking after them and saying, Right, well, I'll just go on the basic income, we'll live together, so that means we'll get about two thousand pounds a month, we can afford a flat, we can go out and do all that sort of shit, and nobody will fucking hassle us ever again. Yeah, you know, we will pull our money and we'll look after our, our elderly or disabled relatives together. They'll just, you know, what? Say you're in a family of four. Granddad's not really good at looking after himself. Now, instead of putting a giant burden, extra burden on the state, as well as you know his state paid care, is because it doesn't pay you to look after an elderly relative yourself. No, because they will fuck with you every inch of the way. Yeah, but but if, you, if you didn't have to work and Granddad doesn't have to work and he gets his universal baking income and you've got it you just go right okay granddad well i'll move in with you we'll split the rent and mm-hmm. my job will be making sure you're all right and then when i need a day off one of the other guys will come over one of the other people will come over in your family and well they'll look after you make your cups of tea and shit and keep your company and stuff yeah and we'll all stay sane and we will cost the government a, an enormous amount less there's lots of people that are actually signed into hospital that don't need to be because the NHS realises that that poor elderly person with a broken hip is going back to an empty house. Mm. You know, so That's the about- burden on the NHS and the criminal justice system are increased when you deny people, you know, um, a, 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 an amount of money that they can live on. Whereas if you just yeah. give it to everybody, it's no big thing. People can choose what to do with their time and their lives. Oh, you just you solve so many problems with universal basic income. And it actually costs so less to just give everybody a load of money, even if you just look at the benefit system. If you just give that money to them, it co- it costs nothing in maintenance. It costs nothing in you're not finding out. You might have like a couple, you know, a couple of hundred fraud officers to make sure the person claiming it actually exists, which is all you'd have to do. You'd have to just say, right, okay, well, this is looking a bit weird. You've got twenty people at the same address in a two-bedroom house, all claiming universal basic income. That's just flagged up. You can put an AI onto that. Yeah, that's the sort easy. of thing AIs are very good at finding. So easy. 
You know, the thing is, as well, you can get rid of once, once if you have universal like basic gaming, you can get rid of retirement. Yeah, it doesn't exist. Because that can be, pensions be, it can be management. Bo- yeah, pensions management doesn't exist anymore. Retirement doesn't exist anymore. It's it's just all voluntary. You can retire whenever you want. You know, you can take sabbaticals whenever you want. Yeah. You know, it's just like... And with the money you save, you can make further education free. Yeah. You could just make it free at the point of access. Just go, right, I'm, I'm going to go to university. I'm just going to quit work. I'm going to go to university and, you know, I might, you know, choose rather than to earn the most money possible, I might choose to do something that actually benefits people. I might become a legal advocate, get my mm. law degree and, like, just sort out things. Because I, 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 I can almost... I can feel it within myself, and this is, I'm not going to say I can always guarantee it, because it can't, but I, I'm, I feel confident that the major, that the reason a majority of people don't go to university, despite wanting to, is because they can't fucking afford it. Is one, because they can't afford it, and two, they've got to think about whether that degree is going to be useful afterwards. Yeah. And it really fucks me off that, because... It's a it's a chasing the changing goalposts situation. Yeah, it takes however many years to. Get yeah, you're a degree. not looking. You're not looking at what a good job is now. You you're looking five five ten fifteen years, at whether that job's even going to exist. Yeah, it might not exist by the time you finish your degree, mm. or you know, it might be. It, you might think, oh, I'll go in now, on in this field that's really that I really like and it's quite popular, and then ten years down the line. You know, when you if you get if you decide to go for your doctorate, when you've got your PhD, that job's just like terrible. Mm. How anyway, do you even want it? We're, yeah. we're we're dragging on a little bit. Um, we are dragging a little bit. So yeah, okay. Um, uh, so uh, next one is me. So model Hanny Gaby Odell um, reveals she is intersex. The break taboo. So there's good news stories. Uh, top fashion model has revealed that she is intersex, saying that she hopes speaking out will help break a taboo. Yeah, Hannah Gaby Odile, 29, was born with undescended testicles, which were removed when she was 10 after doctors warned they could cause cancer. Intersex are born with uh, people are born with a mixture of male and female sex characteristics. And, um, and according to the United Nations, the condition affects up to 1.7% of the world's population. Ms. Odile, originally from Belgium, was born with androgen insensitivity syndrome, AIS, which causes girls to have XY chromosomes and is usually found in that. Uh, yeah, XY chromosomes, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's very important to me in my life right now to break the taboo, she told USA Today in an interview. At this point, in this day and age, it should be perfectly all right to talk about this. At 10, Ms. O'Deal had surgery to remove her testes. I knew at one point after the surgery I could not have kids. I was not having my period. I know I knew something was wrong with me, she said. She had additional surgery at 18 to reconstruct her vagina, but said that procedures caused her distress and she wanted to speak out in in part to discourage other parents from putting their children through perhaps unnecessary surgery. It's not that big of a deal being intersex, she said. If they were just honest from the beginning, it it became a trauma because of what they did. Her husband, John Svitek, also a model, told USA Today he was incredibly proud of his wife for speaking out. I am very impressed with her decision to advocate for intersex children in order to give them an opportunity to make up their own minds about their bodies, unlike the lack of options and information Hannah and her family and many others were given, he said. Her decision to go public about her condition and become a spokesperson and advocate for the intersex community has been praised by the fashion magazine Vogue as an act of enormous courage. Odile is exploring uncharted territory, it commented, as it is impossible to identify even one well-known person in any field who has openly intersex. So that's brilliant. The whole intersex is... debate is a massive fuck you to the whole binary gender people of yeah. the world, and that somebody with that high profile in that sort of range of society, the sort of like the, the super wealthy, is 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 fairly awesome, and mm. it must it, and that's just a, a, a stance of incredible courage to take, given that she she presents as female and she is paid for looking good. That's what she does. She's supposed to look female and wear female clothes and look fantastic and stuff like that but the thing is is that so all these people that say gender is a binary issue 1.7 percent of the world's population so say at any time in a maternity ward there are 100 babies and i'm i'm vastly simplifying here so one to two of those babies will be born intersex just just the, mm-hmm. the odds you know the, the statistical odds 
are that there is another gender, and that is a lot of interse- different intersex things. That's X Y double X born boys, um, double Y born girls, and all that. All the chromosomal pop percentages all lumped in together with intersex, and I'd like to see that divided out as well. But I but that would dilute that percentage. It would make that percentage much much smaller. It'd be like a fifth of what it is. Hmm. So when you say nearly two percent of all children born have some sort of intersex designation, so somebody chooses one of two genders for them and they go with that. Yeah. So yeah, I've, uh, I remember a story I read like a long time ago about. Um, well, this wasn't actually what this wasn't actually an intersex thing. Actually, I'll come back to that. You're going to keep going. Okay. So uh, it's it's really important that we you know with with the you know it causes a lot of distress to a lot of people, and intersex children have, have a very high suicide rate, as well as people that are suffer from um, what is it uh, gender dysphoria where they don't feel like gender dysphoria right. yeah yeah That's so it, yeah. you know and there there is sometimes a very good biological reason why they do not feel like they're in the right body. And I can't begin to imagine what you know. I'm probably you know, I'm 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 starting to become one of the only white heterosexual men in, the, in everybody I know, <laughs> which is I am now a minority almost in the people I know in my social group. I I don't know many men that identify entirely cis het at all anymore. Mm. And it's you know I'm not I'm not saying that uh, that will be a static thing. You know you don't know who you're going to meet on the net. You know so. But it's it's a real sort of just get fucked. There aren't two genders. Yeah. And even if all, all that news story proves is that, it's a bigger, bigger issue by far. There's lots to discuss. There's loads of things that we can we could go on for hours just talking about gender. Oh yeah. But that I mean, one this... that somebody stood up and it's just highlighted this. You know, nearly two percent of all people. So one in fifty people is not, you know, either you know not wholly male, not wholly female. Hmm. And that's an enormous and we're not talking about hermaphroditism just as a thing we're talking about you know the fact that gender does not exist in a binary state yeah in it know, is and, and not one in a million we're talking you know two percent we're talking one in 50. yeah that's a lot that's an enormous amount so that's say you know if you go into like a huge city general maternity hospital you've got 10 babies being born every day on average mm-hmm. and so every at least more than once a week an intersex child is born in that yeah. hospital, just in a, in one hospital, more than one, more than one, you know, you know, more than one a week. Yeah. And so, to just neglect those people and say, "Oh, this is something we don't talk about." What the fuck? Yeah. You know, I'm trying to think of a one in fifty example. You know, that's almost like saying, "Yeah, it'd be almost like saying, well, I'm afraid, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, that your child likes to read." Yeah, it's yeah. not something we talk about, but they're going to enjoy reading, and we we we're just not talk about. It. Imagine if you had to come out as somebody that read books, yeah, or somebody that liked football, or somebody that liked playing with computers, or somebody that you know had a you know didn't want to wear normal shoes, just wanted to wear combat boots, and you couldn't talk mm-hmm. about that. You had to sit at home and put on your combat boots and walk around your house in them, because no, only one in fifty people wore combat boots. Yeah, one in fifty. So that so the binary gender is bullshit. Just the numbers. Yeah. Just the, just cold, the numbers hard fact, That's bollocks. It's out, exactly. up to, so it, that although that's a supermodel, you know, and it's normally a segment of society I don't look at. That's somebody in the public eye that's gone. This is bullshit. Mm-hmm. And you know the, that needs to come up a lot more. I'd, what I'd love to see is like you know a whole bunch of people coming out as intersex now. Or having been intersex and have had has had surgery to sort of like go for one binary gender, and then you know like you can't go wow that's really interesting. Mm. What does that mean for you as a person? Now well, we've got to we've got to do it like this. Yeah, I mean what's the- happened? What's happened to people in sub-Saharan Africa or um, the uh, Saudi Arabia that have been born like this? What the fuck's happened to those poor poor people? Yeah, in a, in a, in a culture that does not recognise anything other than binary gender and will abuse and, and torture and kill and otherwise make their lives difficult so the, um, you know, I mean if you have a, a reasonably sized housewarming party you've got more than 50 people there yeah I remember um, 
watching a. No, I wasn't watching. I was reading a thing that someone had written, and they were like, one of the things they'd written, and this really pissed me off because it was like totally simple. It's oversimplifying the problem. I think this is a oversimplifying things could be really oh, yeah. bad. By a long way. Because it just skips by a lot of things that make that change it from being one thing to another thing. Mm. Um, they'd written. They'd they'd written. Oh look, uh, I'm going to segue into transgender a bit right now. Yeah. They said, "Oh look, transgenders become a popular bandwagon," and it's like <laughs> you can't. That, that's a real oversimplification of the fact of what tra- of what how it is. It's not that people. It's not that it's become a popular bandwagon. We're just not stoning just people to death for it now. Exactly, we're not stoning people to death for it now. We're not ostracizing them for it now. We're not ostracizing people for being trans. I myself am trans. So you know, it's 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 now not a taboo. In yeah. well, okay, a lot of people are still um, intolerant towards. No, no, they're prejudiced. Mm. Should say they'll use the right word, prejudiced towards trans people. But that's changing. It's changing for the better. Um, but what I have seen written, again, as an oversimplification of it, is people who write, when you get a child who's trans and they're going through transition, people who don't understand who are, who are simplifying it will write, oh, these doctors are putting this child on hormones. How does this child know? what they want to be it's oversimplifying it because they don't because the it's not that f- simple at all to go through transition is a long and arduous process before you even get to hormones you have to and this is i'm going to simplify the process a little bit but not oversimplify it you know you have to go through therapy for lack of a better word mm. for a long time prior to even starting any sort of treatment you have to identify for a long time for a while you i think it's a year might be more but you have to identify before you can start transition before you can start any procedure and then if you if, you, if the psychiatrists or uh, say, yeah, no, this is definite, only then will they start on any sort of transitional treatment. And I'm not saying hormones because hormone. Although I did mention hormones earlier, hormones is not a, a, a thing that's definite in any sort of tran- transitional treatment. Um. So if a child is going through transitional treatment, it means they have been identifying as their gender for a a good while and they have been to see multiple psychiatrists Mm. who have all confirmed yes this person is okay to have transitional transitional treatment so it's just like it, but oh, the oversimplifying it is it just taking it at face value that the, that a child is on transitional treatments and it ignores everything else I think about the most, it the most horrible thing about it is is not I mean, I mean although the the, 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 pro, the actual process of transitioning is painful and arduous and, <laughs> and hassle filled but the, just the loneliness yeah I can't imagine what it is. I mean, uh, you know, it's just you're just thinking about one in fifty. You know, you're just you're just thinking about two classes of children, and one child in that class at least is desperately lonely and has a thing inside them they can't talk about. That's mm. the really cruel fucking thing. Because it's it's, it's hidden it's, away. It's there's, not there, about. there's someone that goes. There's no one I can talk to about this. Yeah. You know, they, they, and and anything that isolates a child. I mean, children want to be with everybody else. It's because we've, we've still got this. We've still we're still clinging to this. Um, I can't think of the word. This um, prudish nature of not talking about 
things, of not talking about ourselves properly. Where we won't talk about how we're feeling properly with people. We won't talk about um, things related to sexual health. Hmm. You know, it's trying to get um, sexual education into schools is a, a mammoth task by itself. Hmm. You know, and and when when I was when I did sex education in school, nothing about nothing at all about trans, absolutely nothing. I mean, granted, this was in the nineties, hmm. but nothing about trans. I'm probably I assume the same for yourself. I mean, you were in you were in high school before me. Yeah, it was absolutely nothing. We, did, we got basically no sex education at all. I mean, I was at school up until the mid '80s, and, that, and, and, I'm, t- and I'm telling you, zip. I mean, I was lucky. I grew up in a feminist household and knew what a period was. <laughs> My sex education consisted of what contraceptive was and how to use it. That was it. Oh, and how? Well, okay, it was how to use contraceptive and what contraceptive was used for. So we got taught a lot about STIs, mm. um, but that was it. Nothing else. Nothing about really what it means to be male or female or anything else. No, and certainly nothing about trans. Mm. Certainly nothing about intersex. Other than well, the only thing we 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 knew about intersex was from biology, and even then, in biology, it was treated as a curiosity, mm. which is terrible. But then again, this was in the 90s when um, even teachers didn't really do that, do a lot of research into mm. what they were teaching. You know, and we've. 2% of the world's population isn't a sex. Mm. You know. And that's not people that are trans, that's people who are biologically yeah. uh, a, a different gender altogether than just male or female. Yeah. And it's just that loneliness. So, I mean, you know, I mean, the the truly, it's such a taboo that even when, I mean, I'd say that all the the people in the IRC are a pretty welcoming sort of a bunch. Um, and, you know, one of our number is, uh, one, another of our number is trans and felt that they couldn't tell us for five years. Yeah. Five years. Five years we knew this person and all that entire time they were on their own in this one crucial aspect of who they were and and didn't feel that they could talk to even very chilled out people and th- I, I i you know it we were all we were all very aghast when you know not that that person was trans but that they felt they hadn't been, <sighs> felt that they could talk to us about yeah because we'd have everybody would have been pretty cool you know there's i mean because you're kind of like the 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 first person that was in the ranges you know, mm. it was sort of like, you know, tongue in cheek sort of group of people, which, and we're all different. And, you know, episode one is sort of like, right, we're not going to put up with homophobia, but we weren't even scratching the surface of, of things that people could feel isolated about. Yeah. So if there's anybody out there that wants to talk about trans issues or being homosexual or being bisexual or, you know, anything, asexual even. Yeah. You know, it's this is an inclusive community. You know, feel free to step up and talk about what you want, or to, you know, it, because one hearing one person say "I am gay" or "I am," you know, "I am trans," is removing that burden of isolation for someone. That's why you know, mm-hmm. we always our our audience was always the poor sod in the middle of Arkansas or somewhere or somewhere really intolerant that was just listening to two people just going, "Okay." Well, they don't give a shit what how I present myself, or whether I, or, or who I want to sleep with, or what I want to eat, mm-hmm. or any one of those fundamental human things. And that's just one person out there. There is a voice where people just go, "Yeah, we don't care," <laughs> you know, at all. Exactly. You know, so if you know if you are listening to this and you've chanced upon it and you're in, uh, you feel isolated or anything like that, get in the IRC, talk to a bunch of very chilled out people. Hell yeah, definitely. Yeah. You know, if you think that being trans is weird or being gay is weird, you are not the weirdest person in the room. You know, if you want to be not the weirdest person in the room for once, you know, that's step up, jump into the IRC, anonymize yourself, go into the IRC via tour if you feel that you want to protect yourself. You know, but, you know, just speak to someone. You know, there, yeah. there's, a, there's a lot more people out there in the world that, you know, will be sympathetic, but ultimately won't care how, what, 
you want to present to the world as your gender. I mean, there is a, a remarkable Star Trek episode where Data makes a child and it has no gender when it's born and decides mm-hmm. for itself. That's beautiful, you know, that is. The, the, the worrying thing of that is there is one line in that which made me, pre- you know, when you crinkle your shoulders and you're like, oh, you could have done that much better. Yeah. Is when the the, the new android regards itself and goes, I am gender mut- neuter. Unsatisfactory. Well, that robot could have stayed neutral gender. Yeah. And and but I mean, we're talking. This was made in the eighties, so it's yeah. nearly forty years old. <laughs> Gosh, was <laughs> it the eighties? Yeah, yeah. I was <sighs> late eighties, early nineties is Star Trek. So in a couple Probably of years, it will be yeah. it will be nearly forty years old. Well, yeah, messed up, huh? Yeah, Star Trek yeah. um, was available on VHS in 1989. And I hadn't seen it until 1989. It had already been out long enough for there to have been a VHS edition of it. So, 1986, 87. Mark, the episode you're thinking of. Oh, it's called The Offspring. Yeah. March 12th, 1990. Yeah. So, we're, we're talking nearly 30 years ago. Yeah. Some people, some people have moved on. I wouldn't necessarily say things have moved on. But there are people that have moved on and just gone, you know what? From my own personal perspective, in a zombie apocalypse, as long as that person is halfway competent, I don't give a shit. Mm-hmm. If you are the person that's going to open the door and let the little dog in so all the zombies come in after you, I will shoot you in the head. But uh, outside of that, I, uh, anybody's good with me. I'm kind of yeah. I'm kind of like a competence fascist. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like I look at people and go, hmm, I don't care if you're wearing high heels or lipstick, but if, you know, I need to know that you're going to be halfway sensible. Yep. Yeah, we've never <laughs> we've never said we're 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 access to all stupid people, but if you are intelligent enough to realise that you're different, then the odds are good that <laughs> you would, you'd be welcome at any range of it. If you are the sort of person that would open the door and let all the zombies in, I'm sorry, I don't I don't really care what your gender is. I got to stop you. Mm-hmm. So you know that's that's where it begins and ends with me. You know, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not fussed if somebody's got, you know, sort of like uh, any, any other issues at all. I really don't care whether they're a, a green blob with five legs. As long as you're the sort of person that will look out the door and go, hmm, zombies or little dog. I'm afraid we're going to keep everybody alive and I'm sorry, little dog, but you don't seem to be being attacked by zombies. Go and gnaw off a zombie foot or some shit. <laughs> you know, you don't need my help. However, there are lots of people I care about on the inside of this building and I'm not going to endanger them. That's what I need out of people. Yeah. I don't really yeah. care what their plumbing looks like or what they've chosen their plumbing is going to look like or who they'd like to sleep with because I don't watch my heterosexual friends fuck. So, yeah. you know, I don't sort of keep an eye on them to make sure they're not kinky or weird and I'm a bit kinky <laughs> and weird, so I, I, I don't really care. So as long as that person's halfway sensible and worth and, and of good conversation, then that's good enough for me. That's really where it begins and ends. Hell yeah. You know, I, I, I can't really pretend I would be friendly to someone that was really, really stupid because they probably voted for Brexit or if they're in America, voted for Trump. <laughs> so th- th- it's at that point, with what you do as a human, I care. And I would probably yep. not associate with that person. But with how... How how you choose pre- to present that humanity? I just don't give a I don't give a flying fuck basically. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um. So we're going to move on because that that is a bigger issue. We will come back to that. But I want more people yeah. in the room. I want a wider breadth. And I mean, we've got quite a breadth of experience with the two of us because we're covering a lot of bases. But I would like uh you know I'd, I'd love to have a big conference call with you know lots of people that are different, some bisexual people, some trans people, some gay people, and you know. People are oppressed for other reasons. It would be nice to have some um, people of colour in the ranges, but we don't seem to have managed to sort of attract any yet. Unfortunately, yeah. That's a little it's a, bit worrying. It's a, it's a little bit white bread, but, you know... Yeah, a little again, bit white bread, yeah. We are speaking English, and that's a fairly small popu- percentage of the world to start with. I mean, we do this have some true. people that don't speak English, but it's not, you know... If, if, if by any means I could sort of, like, make us a more representative sort of a group of people, I would. Mm-hmm. But it's just down to your own personal experience and shit like that, and and the things that we're interested in. We tend to be geeky, you know. That seems to be the sort of like the unifying thing, and we tend to be a little bit outdoorsy and kind of into tactical shit. Yeah, 
And if somebody pokes their head above the parapets and says, hi, I'm, you know, Native American or I'm Chinese or I'm, you know, from I'm Ghanaian, but I'm interested in this shit too, then turn the fuck up for God's sake. Hell yeah. Yeah. It's it's a bit like being all guys. And it's like, this is a bit of a sausage fest. I don't know what the, the, the white... <sighs> The white English speaking equivalent of a sausage fest is wasp nest. <laughs> <laughs> We're not to stop this being quite so much of a wasp nest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep that. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> it just occurred to me because it was like think, trying to think of what what's the term, what's that it's, sort of traditional term for white people, and it's yeah. wasp. Yeah. <laughs> we got to stop this from being such a cracker barrel. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be nice. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go on to the last news story because we're at an hour and a half. Oh, wow, cool. already? Jeez. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, oh. um, and this is a downer. I'd, I, I would have liked to have ended on an upper. It's just the way I put together the thing. I'd, I'd like to do the John Craven style, you know. And in other news... A squirrel was saved yesterday and adopted into a small family of um, red foxes. No, it's not going to happen because the world's a fucked up place. So uh, a Russian bill to decriminalise some forms of domestic violence has moved a step closer to becoming law. Motherfuckers. And you can tell this is just like, oh, this is Trump's next move. The lower yeah. house of parliament, the Duma, overwhelmingly approved the proposal after a second reading. First time offenders who cause less serious industry injuries could face fines or community service rather than prison under the plans. But campaigners said the bill would mean the exoneration of tyrants in the home. Pretty much. MPs voted 358 to 2 in favour of the proposals. What is one abstention? The bill dubbed the slapping law by some Russian media outlets will now have a third reading. It will also need approval of the upper house and President Vladimir Putin before becoming law. Oh yeah, they're really going to stop that. Yeah. Um, Kremlin spokesman Dmit Dmitry Peskov said it was important to distinguish between family relations and repeated incidents of violence. <sighs> Fuck. Oh. A slap is not fucking hell. Domestic violence is not family relations. Jesus yeah. Christ, it's violence. Oh, oh, I don't know if you've read the story, but wait, there's an even better term for it that uh, makes, you, makes your blood run cold. The bill was introduced by MT MP Yelena Mitsuluna, a highly conservative lawmaker, in July after a criminal change in the code made beating a family member a criminal offence. Conservative feared that the decision would, need pa would mean parents could be prosecuted for disciplining their children. And that... So domestic violence is just going to be towards children, which is either you've ignored, you know, adult, other adults in the household, or you've basically just infantilized, infantized, infant, infantized women more again. So under the proposals, the first offence would be prosecuted under civil rather than criminal law. Subsequent incidents could still be considered criminal offences and carry potential jail terms. But if all, all that's happened is that the head of your household who has been domestically violent has slapped or beaten his wife or his girlfriend because it's it's it, invariably men and women but it, it sometimes happens the other way around sometimes women are perpetrators of domestic violence but that's a much smaller percentage under the proposals a first offense would be prosecuted uh, la, 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 that and so it, you're basically saying so things are going to be so much better when you you call the police and the police find the head of your household yeah so things are going to go really well after that, aren't they? It's never going to happen again. That person's going to go, I've just been fined money. I should be reasonable about that. A person that's going to be reasonable about that and then say, I did wrong, is not the sort of person that's going to slap someone or beat someone in the first place. In the first place, yeah. It's going to be a fucking tyrant that enjoys abusing women. They're going to, just going to beat the shit out of the person that's caused that. Yeah. Um, and Andrei Isayev, an MP for President Putin's United Russia Party, told the Associated Press, This is a historic vote because certain countries, in certain countries the state's role in family life is way too much. Today's vote will end such practices in the Russian Federation, but opponents said the law will put women and children at greater risk of violence. But anybody with a brain will realise that. Maria mm -hmm. Mahokova, executive director of the Sisters Crisis Center for Abuse Victims, told Reuters, this law calls for the exoneration of tyrants in the home. The message is, let's, pun not, let's not punish him, a person at, who at home beat up his family just because he has the right to do that. Official data on domestic violence in Russia is very limited, but estimates based on regional studies say that each year 600,000 women face physical and verbal abuse in the home, and 14,000 die from injuries inflicted by their husbands or partners. 
Women's rights activist Alenia Popova ridiculed the bill in a tweet. The authorities see only the benefits behind domestic violence. One, many won't live until retirement age, and two, people will be busy with self-destruction and not criticise the authorities. Ms Popova's petition calling for comprehensive legislation against domestic violence has reached more than 225,000 signatures. Some social media users made a light made light of the law. Um, uh, boxing in the kitchen is now legalised, one Raconte post said. Boxing in the kitchen. Seriously. Yeah. Other other men spoke directly against well, that, the that, plans. Well, that's 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 that's, uh, that's that's just making that's not. I, mean, I think that they're, they're, what they're trying to do there is highlight the absurdity of it. Mm. Oh yeah, but imagine that that terminology just makes your blood run cold. Yeah, like, it's, likening domestic violence to a sport is yeah. essentially what's going down then, and the infantilizing that the, sort of this this whole thing where you know as the head of a household everybody else is inferior to you. Mm. So if you slap someone around, that's, you know, that's, well, you know, if it comes to light and you've wasted police time and we've had to come out and deal with it, then we'll find you. I hadn't actually thought of that sentence as being, uh, yeah. comparing it to a sport. So yeah, actually, you, I mean, it's, you it's said it's that pretty, now, that's, uh, it's yeah. absolutely fucking horrifying. And it just, yeah, anybody that just feels that your solution to your problem is to beat up the person that disagrees with you mm-hmm. and that be an okay thing is just an animal. You know. Well, this is coming from the country that thinks that gay people are paedophiles. Yep. They think that they think that homosexuality and paedophilia are the same thing. Hmm. Okay, uh, so to just wrap this up, but other men spoke directly against the plans. It's not a laughing matter. Domestic violence will flourish. I consider this bill anti-national. Another Bogonte user wrote that must be a Russian equivalent of Twitter. I feel yeah, shame for a... such a doom. A punishment for family violence should be harsher. No one has the right to raise their hand against a human a living being said a woman on facebook but yeah i mean it's just like okay so a certain section of the population it's okay to beat the shit out of them and this this whole you know I, and it has to be said i am in certain circumstances very very limited circumstances it's okay to slap a child to on the bottom to stop them yeah. from doing something really frigging dangerous you know, if a child is throwing a temper tantrum next to a road, you've got to stop that temper tantrum right now. You can't let go mm. of their hand. You can't have a quiet discussion with them. If they're freaking out, sometimes you need to shock them into paying attention. Yep. But I'm saying that's one in a, one in a hundred thousand tantrums is going to take place like that. You know, you'll be, you know, and I have, I have slapped my own child because she threw a temper tantrum right next to a main road with traffic traveling past it at like 30 or 40 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. If I didn't have time to have a reasoned discussion, I didn't have time to to do anything other than slap her on the bum and pull her out of the road. Yeah. And th- that worked. And, you know, I wouldn't want to go to prison for that. You know, I, cons- I considered it as my only option in those circumstances. I didn't, I had like a second to react. Yeah. And that had to happen instantly. It wasn't a, I don't have five seconds, I don't have four seconds, I have now. So yeah. I must stop this dead in its tracks. And, you know, that's why if, if a child is completely freaking out, the urge to slap them on the bum is very powerful because it's, you know, it's how animals do it. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, it's like you must be quiet right now and pay attention to your immediate surroundings, which you're not paying attention to now and I don't have time to discuss it with you. And, you know, and... There are there are finite times where that's necessary, but those times are very very limited. It's not you know if a child's just throwing a throwing a, a wobbly in a supermarket, it, I'm not saying you should slap the shit out of them. You you know you're in a, a relatively safe environment. You can you can sort of say right screw you no. The answer is yeah. no. It's going to stay no. And now I'm going to punish you in some way so you understand that this is not okay. But you know. So it's it's just very occasionally when a child is about to do something horrendously dangerous, you don't have time for that discussion. Yeah. You know, and that's the only circumstance under which I w- I would say it's permissible to slap a child. And then I'm not saying beat them around the head and take a baseball bat to them. I'm saying a quick slap to the buttocks, where they're already padded, where it's just going to sting for a couple of minutes and cause no lasting damage at all. Once, 
You only need one, and that child will sort of like, you know, be so shocked they'll stop what they're doing immediately. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but this is just absolutely appalling. You know, how, just how, how long would it take to prosecute a civil, a civil case for domestic violence? Years? Yeah. With all the paperwork it takes to bring a civil suit? About that. Yeah, in the Soviet not... Union, where it's now just been deemed as a non-priority? Yeah. So at what point is it a criminal offence? When somebody's got broken bones? When somebody's been killed? Yeah. You know, 14,000 women, in the main, killed. 600,000 yeah. women abused. It's disgusting. Hmm. It really is. When a lot of this abuse comes from people not treating each other as adults or humans. Well, yeah. You know, that's most of it. If you don't respect someone as another human being, that's where that's going to lead. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that's that's all the news we've got for you tonight. Uh, uh, today, rather. It's not quite the evening. But, uh, yeah. So that's our roundup. Well, that's my roundup of the news. Um, I think I... So all the links will be in the running order. I think yep. uh, nobody sent me anything there. this week. I don't think any of it was... To be honest, I put it together on the fly. I'm trying to get the running orders a bit more thing. But if you have any news stories you'd like us to cover or talk about, you know, all you need to do is email it or drop into the IRC and tell someone and they will pass it on to me. Or you can email me directly at v4v at earthling.net. Cool. So we're going to go into the halftime music now. Mm-hmm. Is that halftime? What have we got? Um, so I've um, got two... We've got some tracks uh, that I've been sent um, that I have permission to use um, for playlisting purposes, which means we can play it in a podcast. Um, cool. First one is Does Anyone Remember Me by the American Anymen and Lees. Um, mm -hmm. Their new EP is out now from Shameless Promotion. And Lone Gypsy with El Topo, uh, El to Lone Gypsy by El Topo, which is a new single out on February the 2nd, thanks to German Shepherd Records. And uh, nice. just a quick Google search will bring those up. And we're going to play that and uh, have a quick break, because I think one of us at least will need to use the loop. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll be back after these songs. Catch you in a bit. Picture this. We're selling images of me. Stuck in a room nobody can see. What's going on inside? Can't see the sun or imagine the sky But I know in my mind that the sun does still rise I know in my mind that the sky's burning bright I just don't know if I'm still on anyone's mind Yeah. 
I own no 
Yeah, so we're back. Hope you enjoyed the music. It's always good to play uh, sort of what I call open source music, indie music, properly independent, yeah. not the stuff that gets labelled indie, but uh, properly independent people making music. So it's worth checking out um, German Shepherd Records and uh, Shameless Promotion. So I'm a huge fan, and it's, it was really cool that they've sent us stuff. I tried getting stuff from A Future Without Records, but they've gone all digital. And although it's, pay, right. what, it's pay what you like, I really don't want to put my credit card on something that's... Uh, not necessary. So, yeah. if you know any musicians that have got some tracks together, um, Iron Angel in the IRC is doing um, a thing, record an album in a month, sort of like Nano mm-hmm. Rimo for music. So, All hopefully, right. we'll get some stuff out the back end of that and see if we can play some of his gear. Well, what's so, up man, that? Or if you know of a record company or anything like that that, that wants their stuff played on on, on air, on digital yeah, well, air. Yeah. Well, Mentioning well, record companies and stuff. Mm. Very just very quick aside because it's on the it's on the topic of like music that's not by big companies. It's not not by the big labels. Hmm. Um, I ordered on cassette the KLF's album, The White Room, because hmm. it's it's in my opinion it's a really good album. Yeah, and they released it themselves. Oh, right, cool! It's by it, it's really it's published by KLF Communications. Nice. Not not EMI or Sony or anything like that. KLF Communications, and it's just like yeah, that's must have, very cool. I, I like the the model that seems to be emerging, where if a band's any good, um, they'll put out their stuff for free, and then you can mm-hmm. buy the CD and stuff like that to support the band. If you really like what they do, with bands that are you know independent and just saying right, okay, so we need X thousand to make the new album, and that was kind of started by Amanda Palmer. But what I didn't know is I used to be a real major fan of Pompidamoose. Yeah. And I still listen to their stuff. Um, but uh, one half of that, Jack Conte, is the guy that developed Patreon. Oh, really? Yeah. That was pretty cool. How cool is that? So, uh, that is very cool. Yeah. And uh, just a heads up, I'm thinking of setting up a Rangers Patreon page for, you know, just making sure that we can keep producing it. <clears throat> mm. I'm just putting out. I'm not doing it just yet. I'm going to put out some new Rangers content so that we've got like a whole bunch of Rangers radio podcasts, a whole bunch of videos out, and then maybe discuss with the people in the IRC. You know, get a group discussion going and saying what might Patre- the Patreon pay for. So if we if we do end up generating what I'm hoping that we'll get some more audio and video feeds in from other people as they start to produce their own stuff. Yeah. Um, then we distribute that out, you know, as a percentage of airtime. So if if we become, so say there's a Rangers Oz or a Rangers America, and say, I don't know, say £100 is coming in and Rangers Oz is producing, say, 15% of the airtime, mm-hmm. or 10% of the video, we work out what that is and distribute it so people have got a little bit of extra money so they can buy kit for review and kit to make the um the stuff with so yeah. you know it'd be nice if you know if if we get a bigger listenership we can start saying right okay so it divvies up like this so many hours have been produced by this and you know so many hours put in and things like that so yeah. so if everybody that sort of contributes like and actually records and produces new media we can take a share of that so we could possibly build the channel and make it like its own network if you like mm-hmm. so yeah which is you know so patreon a very good thing and lots of i've noticed your name pop up on a lot of channels i've been watching yeah i've um i've been i've i do support a few people a couple of people on patreon i support <laughs> um i support um uh kim justice yeah and also support hedge bomber guy and have you done anything with lazy game reviews? No, not not LGR. Yeah, no. That's another one to check out. I mean, if you want to be really lazy, I I, I recommend the thrift store ones because it it cures yeah. it, it totally cures you of that urge to go into every charity shop to see if you can buy find something interesting. 
because he's got the best goodwill and charity stores in you know in the world at his fingertips, and it just it just cures you of, of rifling through stuff quite a bit, unless you're looking mm-hmm. for records, and then it's all bets are off. Yes, <laughs> yeah, because uh, I still do that. Okay, um, I want to, before I forget, and I will forget if we get onto a, a discussion, um, to, I'd like to thank everybody that's listened to the show so far, and uh, uh, we'd love to keep you as listeners. If we're not including something or not discussing that you'd like to hear discussed, or you'd like to be part of it, or you have anything that you'd like to add, please add it in. Even if it's just you want an email read out on air and you don't want to be on audio, although this uh, the Mumble server is completely awesome for audio so you do get as long as you've got a reasonable quality microphone you get a good thing um and uh yeah please join in on the irc as i've said before but you know become part of the community at the moment yeah. in the irc although nobody's speaking we've got ham gammon ikibai which is a robot uh iron angel kevin is a geek Nefit, mr echo uh nalox paonia me and step john so i know that Mephit and mr echo are both hardcore ramp people and method um i'm probably pronouncing that wrong um produced the pain magazine which was awesome i don't know if you've ever read any issues of pain it's, no uh, but have a look for it it's p-a-1-n and it was like a a, a, a magazine produced within the, the ramp media framework all its downloadable pdfs and i must admit i did print them all off at one time and had them in binders but uh, after going off grid um I, I didn't have any room for them, but I've still got them yeah. somewhere as PDF files. And I'd also like to point out that the whole show is being created with open source software. So Mumble is open source, the Ubuntu that I'm using, the recorder built into Mumble, Caden Live for the video stuff I'm doing, and uh, all the other good stuff and Audacity that we use to edit the show. That's all open source and all being used on the Linux platform. And uh, if anybody's interested in that or doesn't doesn't wants to dip their toe in the waters, maybe we need to do a a Linux tutorial series or something like that on how to get shit done in Linux. You mm-hmm. know, the sort of like creative stuff and, you know, because I've noticed that Caden Live has upped its game quite remarkably. That's good. And uh, is is quite the video editor. I've, I've you know, learned a few trips, tip, tri- tips and tricks. Try saying that when you're hammered. Um, mm. <laughs> and and uh, trips and ticks, which is when you go wandering through Bracken and shorts. Um, yeah so open source software is another thing I think we probably need to champion a bit and uh, I'm amazed at Ubuntu these days it's awesome and uh, now Chromium has been the Chrome browser has been fixed so that you can watch uh, Netflix which was previously just straight out the gate just install Chrome and it just does it so yeah there there isn't anything Uh, there are a couple of games I play that probably won't translate through Wine but to be honest I haven't tried so you know, that's mm-hmm. pretty much it. Everything else is all the video editing. I first started using it recently again as my primary operating system because my scanner wouldn't work. I don't use it very often, but my scanner wouldn't work in Windows 7. Just there were no yeah. drivers um, with the company. Um, screw you, must tech. Um, <laughs> wouldn't even produce a Windows 7 driver. So because they were now on Windows 10 and there was no way I was going to upgrade to Windows 10. Yeah. And uh, so I just plugged it in to my to my Linux install. Uh, and it, it works just, fine. It just works. Like my printer, just works. Like my phone and everything I plug into it, they just fucking work. Just all my peripherals work perfectly with Linux. And so, like, so no hardware dicking around or anything. The Mumble server just works. My little external USB mixer, everything. So it's lovely. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so we were going to talk a little bit more about the, uh, the fascism thing that we've been noticing, especially in the last week. It's sort of yeah. like every time we come up with a sort of like, oh, fascism is making a comeback, it just gets worse. It so, really does. So you've had Donald Trump sort of refusing immigration from Muslim countries and hassling people that were just traveling to and from massively. And then yep. rather wonderfully, the people of America just sending in lawyers and having lawyers deal with it at airports, you know, just wandering up to people and handing out leaflets and saying, there are lawyers over there that can help you mm-hmm. in the McDonald's. So I, I, I don't know whether McDonald's knew that they were hosting a, a legal team for the day. I hope they do. I, I like to think that they don't officially know, but they know. Yeah. I, I'd like to think that, especially in an airport. I'm telling you, if you're at a transit hub, doing anything in a transit hub that may be deemed as suspicious is a bit difficult. 
because yeah. the businesses that operate in the transit hub are kind of liable for anything that goes off, any security that they don't observe. Because um, I know that because I work in a train station. And uh, when you, if you work in a train station for another business, you get a really scary video when you first start working there in order to get your security pass so you can get in and out of the doors. Because you've got your business and then you've got access to all the other things like um, waste removal and stuff like that. Um, in UK stations, we haven't had bins in a long, long time because of uh, the IRA bombing campaign in the 70s. So there are no waste disposal bins anywhere in UK train stations or airports. Um, so you have to pass a security vetting in order to, even if you're working at a Starbucks in an airport or a Starbucks in a rail station, because it's a transit hub and there are lots of random people there all the time. And, you know, you can't watch any, everybody in a transit hub. Everybody's about their business. So you get this scary mm -hmm. video about what to do in the event of gunfire and yep. what to do in the event of a terrorist attack and shit. So having all these people in open opposition to the government in a McDonald's was super awesome. And, uh, yeah, that was just a bit I wanted to say about that. It was interesting that, you know, that they were just setting up shop wherever they could and just, like, getting out their laptops and sorting shit out for people pro bono, just totally for free. Well, yeah, that's what... I mean, that's the one thing that's, like, giving me... That's one of the things that's giving me hope for the future. The mobilised that... opposition is probably the biggest thing since the civil rights movement. Yeah, easily. You know, the, the Not women, just... The, the pro-women march... Um, alone was a good few million people countrywide in the states. Oh yeah, and and around the world. <laughs> yeah. So, well done to everybody that was a part of that and is continuing to be a part of that. Because mm -hmm. you know, especially with things like the abortion laws that are coming in now in America, are getting truly scary. This, you know, and it's it's like a number of comedians have said, you know, they care about this thing while it's a fetus and then proceed to not give a shit about it once it's born. You know, mm -hmm. and it's just a way of keeping poor people poor. Because the more children you have, the poorer you're going to be. If you're working class, children are a, a financial burden. And they're a burden on the fucking planet too. So the idea of when somebody doesn't want a child, stopping them from not having, stopping them from getting rid of that fetus is, is paramount. You know, giving people access to fucking contraception would be a start. Sex education. Make sure there are less unwanted pregnancies to start with. But don't, you know force people to have children that's just a control mechanism well there's um, a thing I've seen recently regarding this where um, people have been highlighting the hypocrisy of um, <clears throat> saying that trying to shut down Planned Parenthood but also um, trying to cut the be trying to cut back on welfare for children yeah you can't have it, 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 it just yeah it just paints a picture of you 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 don't care about the children you're just trying to make a they political don't. point it's, and also keep the people down. It's those people's entire life. You cut back on welfare. You cut back on child welfare. You cut back on education. So you just destroy the resources for someone to have a decent life. So you know if you're poor and American and you need an abortion, one, you're going to get hounded to fuck by right, you know, so-called well-meaning um, religious people. And then... Mm -hmm. The government is not even giving you your rights. I mean, the whole it's Roe versus Wade, isn't it, in America? Yeah. The uh, the the lawsuit that you know basically said people could get abortions. I believe so. Yes. But it's just control. It's just keeping people in their assigned spot in life. Because if you if that child is born, it's going to have you know no resources in the home, no educational resources, no welfare resources, no resources outside school. And that's just going to be another person that's going to turn to crime. So mm -hmm. un unless somebody was evil enough to want to, I don't know, increase the prison population to, pr to help out the prison industrial complex, and I can't believe a government would want more people in prison. Um, <laughs> that was, that was, I couldn't even be sarcastic. <laughs> I was just too angry. But it's just, yeah. it, you're just generating prisoners. And prisoners are not just increasing, you know, because basically when you have, if you have, a lot of prisons in America are private. And if you have a prison that's private, that contractor charges the government so much a year for the upkeep. And it's like 30, mm -hmm. 000, 30 to $50,000 per inmate. So it's not chump yeah. change. If somebody said they were going to give you the value of a small house every year to look after someone and keep them off the streets, ideally, a, a right-thinking government would go, well, we want as few people as possible in prison. Because you know? 
because it's going to cost us an absolute fortune. But when some of those people that are voting in those things are, are cronies of, and sometimes shareholders in prisons, all they're looking at is a profit margin, which is, and I hate to use the term in a, in a kind of a disrespectful way for the history of, of America specifically, and the UK as well, but that is slavery because you're preventing someone from living their life in order to generate money. Those mm -hmm. people can't vote, they can't do anything, they can't have relationships, they can't have any sort of a life, or uh, now in America, any education. Yet you can use them as a workforce. It's illegal not to have a job in a jail in America. It's not an option, you have to be employed. And generally those employers are the people that have work done in prison, the people like Dell. Dell specifically, if you if you own a Dell computer, the chances of it being made for no money, pretty much, by a prison inmate is extremely high. It's about 90% of Dell's manufacturing is in prisons. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's just one I know about. I bet if you looked up, and we can do this right now, let's just put in into Google, corporations that use prison labor. Okay, seven ha household names that are making uh, killing off pri the prison industrial concept co um, complex. Okay, so let's have let's see if we've heard of any of them. Whole Foods, I've um, heard of Whole Foods, costly organic supermarket, often nicknamed Whole Paycheck, purchases artisan cheese and fish prepared by inmates who work for private companies. The inmates are paid seventy four cents a day to raise tilapia, which is su subsequently sold for eleven ninety nine a pound at the grocery store. McDonald's, one of the most successful fast food franchises, purchases a plethora of goods manufactured in prison, including plastic cutlery, containers and uniforms. Inmates who sew McDonald's uniforms make even less uh, money by the hour than people who wear them. It's probably, again, 74 cents a day, because you can't earn a lot in prison. Walmart, no surprise there, although their company policy clearly states that forced prison labor will not be tolerated by Walmart, basically every item in their store has been supplied by third-party prison labor factories. Walmart purchases its produce from prison farms where laborers are often subjected to long arduous hours in the blazing heat without adequate sunscreen, water or food. Victoria's Secret, female inmates in, the South, Carolina, in South Carolina sew undergarments and casual wear for the price of lingerie company. In the late 1990s, two prisoners were placed in solitary confinement for telling journalists they were hired to replace made in Honduras garment tags with made in USA tags. Victoria's Secret has declined to comment. Aramark, the company that provides food to colleges, public schools and hospitals, has a monopoly on food services in about 600 prisons in the US. Despite this, Aramark has a history of poor food service, including massive food shortages that caused a prison riot in Kentucky in 2009. AT&T, in 1993, the massive phone company laid off thousands of telephone operators, all union members, in order to increase their profits. And even though AT&T's company policy regarding prison labor reads eerily like Walmart's, they've consistently used inmates to help work in their call centers since 1993, paying them less than $2 a day. BP. When BP was spilled 4.2 million barrels of uh, oil was into the Gulf Coast, the company sent a workforce of almost exclusively African-American inmates to clean up the toxic spill, while community members, many of whom were out of work, fishermen struggled to make ends meet. BP's decision to use prisoners instead of hiring displaced workers outraged the Gulf community, but the oil company did nothing to reconcile this, uh, this situation. So from dentures to shower curtains to pill bottles, almost everything you can imagine is being made in American prisons. Also implicit is the past and present use of prison labor are Microsoft, Nike, Nintendo, Honda, Pfizer, Saks, Fifth Avenue, JCPenney, Macy's, Starbucks, and loads more. And in fact, I think it was Delta Airlines. If you made a reservation on Delta Airlines, generally anywhere up until about 2010, the chances that you were speaking to a prison inmate were like 98%. Yep. Yeah. So you are employing people at less than the minimum wage, less than slave, way, way less than the minimum wage. And, and the, the businesses bitch about minimum wage in America, but they're mostly, you know, saving huge amounts of money by employing prison labor. And one of the highest paying prison jobs in the country is selling American flags for the state police. Yeah, so, you know, that's slavery. That really is. That's not like you've got an option to work there. Yeah. You're not being paid anything. I mean, working for 75 cents a day. 
that's the money that you is. get. That's the money you get to spend in the commissary. Yeah. So, and the commissary in these places is also owned by the prison, and it's also up. It charges more than the local grocery store. So what the that fuck? Is. So use of prison yeah. labor is slavery. If you don't have an option to do it, and your volition and your ability to vote and your franchise is all taken away from you, that's slavery. Yep. So it's in America in America's GDP interest to have more prisons. Hence new things being made illegal as we speak. So I mean they've gone from, you know, fucking people economically to, you know, and just saying, well, okay, we're gonna up your taxes or we're gonna destroy industry and stuff like that. So you're all gonna be working in a fucking Walmart. That's not good enough mm -hmm. for the government in America. And I suspect, you know, if America gets away with it, generally speaking, it makes its way. It slithers its way over to the UK. And especially when now out of Brexit. Yeah. Do you think that when our, when our economy starts to crumble, we won't be doing prison labour? Should we see if there's any prison labour in the UK? Where's this mo mo movement of fascism goes? Prison labour in the UK. UK prison labour industry. Do, 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 do. Okay. Uh, no, 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 no. Okay. DHL. Uh, according to One Three One website, the global distribution company employs over eight hundred UK-based prisoners to receive orders, pick, pack, and ship. Meanwhile, they've been shutting distribution centres, laying off hundreds of pay staff across the country including 330 jobs in Droitwich, 200 job losses in Swindon, and further job losses in Scunthorpe and Corby, and slashing wages across their distribution network, prompting strike action. And Going Green, a Cardiff-based lost insulation and solar installation company, laid off 17 workers at their call centre and placed them with prisoners from Cresco Crescoid Prison, that sounds like Wales, at an hourly rate of just 40 pence an hour. Speedy Hire, a tool hire company that sacked 800 workers and shut down 75 depots in 2010. Since then, massively increased the size of their prison contract to service and repair the tools they hire out, paying Earlstoke, Garth and Pentonville prisons £114,012 for the services of around 100, prison, 100 prisoners during 2010 to 2011. Timson, the boss James Simpson, is happy to act as a propaganda mouthpiece of the government's prison labour scheme, but what he fails to mention is the praise for the programme is that his company's increased use of prison labour coincided with a wave of redundancies and wiped out some 30% of the paid workers at the company. Cisco is mentioned by the Tory MP Andrew Salou as being a big player in the government's prison labour scheme. In August 2016, the company announced that it plans to lay off 5,500 workers worldwide. Perhaps they could prevent a few job losses in the UK by bringing the services they've outsourced to prison labour schemes back in-house. Mm. So it's already fucking happening. And companies you've heard for. And that's at Another Angry Voice. is a pay-as-you-feel website. And they seem to be pretty good, so you might want to go and check out them. Yeah, it's also yeah. Uh, echoed on uh, the Guardian and the Independent as well. Yeah, and the um, stats for the uh, American ones are from USUncuts dot com, which I suspect US Uncuts. Yeah, US Uncuts a bit hyper liberal, but and clickbaity. But um, I I haven't read through that particular article. As long as yeah. I've got decent cited sources, it should be okay. Well, that's that's how that shit starts. You know. Yeah. You are a commodity. I mean, do you know what the um, have you heard? You've heard of Am Shinrinku, haven't you? The a Japanese cult that released Sarin on the Tokyo Underground in the nineties. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I've heard of Am Shinrinku. Yeah, their mantra, and I'm not saying that it was a good idea to do that, or allegedly they managed to detonate a nuclear device in Australia in the outback. But their mantra was, "We are being farmed." Hmm. And they were uh, an apocalypse cult, like basically the world is coming to an end, or for a lot of people it would seem like it might as well. Yeah. And, you know, but we, if, if you're, if you're, if you've got companies that it benefits to move to prison labor, people with no choice but to work. I mean, how long before it's mandatory to have a job while you're in jail? Mm. And not just uh, doing the laundry for the jail or doing farming to grow food for the jail to make it less expensive to run. Which, in a state-run prison, you can understand. You know, you make these things as self-sufficient as you possibly can, and that releases a burden from the taxpayer. I get that, 
I get that maybe maintaining the jail itself, like painting and decorating, could be done in-house. And then at least people, when they get out, have some sort of employment history for the time they've been in jail. I kind of get that. But having companies benefit from people being in prison... Yeah, that's a different thing entirely. You know, it's not like sewing mailbags or anything like that for the state or doing some kind of state-sponsored work. Fair enough, at a very reduced rate. But to pay someone 74 cents a day... So, uh, in, a, in a sort of feel-good thing of this, actually, to turn it on its head, mm-hmm. of where uh, I, I found an article on The Guardian where um, a prison has actually co- co- um, created the prisoners within a prison created a company called Inmate Art mm. and they make they make and sell art mm. from the prison they run they, it's their own little business they run it yeah and they they and that's and they that, that's their work experience they're making good money on that I mean okay most of it goes to this but it goes to the prison but you know they're they're actually making the there it's, it's not someone else um, exploiting them um, I mean, I there was like... a. To, to, I'm going to drop. I'm going to name drop a celebrity here. There was a uh, Gordon Ramsay, mm-hmm. whatever your opinion of him is, did a TV show called Ram called Ramsay Behind Bars. Mm-hmm. It's probably on YouTube now, um, where he went into a prison and set up a kitchen, not only for the <laughs> kitchen to cook food for the inmates. But also to well, actually no, it wasn't. Sorry, start again. Set up a kitchen in the prison for the prisoners to learn how to cook, and then sell that produce outside of the prison. Hmm. Though they wouldn't sell it, it would get sold by people that they would employ to sell it. But the food would be made in the prison, and that's what we need. That's what you need if you if you want to get prisoners working. You have to engage with the prisoners because you've got to. The thing that really annoys me about prison is people seem to think that prison exists for one reason and one reason only and that's to keep it's to punish prisoners Mm. that's not what it's there for it's not to put it's not there as a punishment for criminals prison exists for two reasons first reason it exists to protect us from them during number two their rehabilitation period yeah I mean, why not? And I mean, there's probably you, very little money being put into counselling people. Why were you so angry that you did this mean fucking thing? Exactly. It's like if you if you there are very few actual evil people in the world. Oh, everybody thinks they're doing the right thing, or they they've got no choice. Yeah, um, and that's why rehabilitation is important for the people who do end up in prison. But if you're if you're treating it like punishments, then rehabilitation becomes an afterthought. When it shouldn't be, it should be the rehabilitation should be at the front of it. Mm. And giving um, the inmates, those inside, a a way of helping, a, a way of channeling themselves into something worthwhile through their own work not through a job they're forced to have but through a job they actually want to do he's brilliant you know it's the problem we've got right is that these ideas have been in the in in the justice department for a long time and when they've been applied correctly they have worked yeah fantastically the problem is, is that they get applied correctly for about a couple of years, and this was happening with people uh, being able to do degrees and stuff mm. while they were locked away. And then the government comes calling and starts taking money away from budgets, and then the so the the prisons have to cut back on what they do. They can't afford as many security guards. They can't afford these rehabilitation programs. And suddenly the prisons are failing. But it's robbing Peter to pay Paul because those people are just going to yeah. go out and commit more crime, which is going to cost an absolute fortune. They'll be back in jail. All because the government is penny pinching. Mm. Well, it's, it's it's a false economy. Yeah. And if you really were being hard nosed and practical about it, 
you just say, well, no, I mean, because it costs X thousand to do a trial. It costs X thousand in recompense for the person that's been, um, you know, injured or, you know, you know, harmed by this crime. You've also got to warehouse that person for about 30 grand a year. You know, I mean, 30 grand a year is more expensive than a college degree. Yeah. You know, so it's just like, you know, so it's three times what it would cost to just give someone the money to go to university. Mm -hmm. You know, so, I mean, I mean, then that does raise the thing. If you're going to let, you know, inmates do degrees, then that means charging, charging students to do degrees becomes pointless, you know, and really unfair. If you're gonna, well, if, it is. If you could commit I, a crime that would put you away for three years, you could say, right, OK, I'm going to commit this crime and then I'll get my free college degree. I mean, yeah. imagine that no, being the. Imagine somebody. How cold and weird that would be if somebody said, "And why did you, you know, attack this person that was unconnected to you?" And they say, "I wanted to go away education. for about three years so I could get a free education because I don't want to yeah. be in debt my whole life." This is why the why it's terrible that tuition isn't free. It is in Scotland, and they don't seem to yeah. be truly screwed over by it. That doesn't harm them. No. Doesn't all. Oh. It's just. Let's not forget, right, that the two main parties are as bad as each other. And I, I. A lot of people give the Liberal Democrats flack for not sticking to their promise of um, scrapping tuition fees. Mm. And, you know, they did promise that. However, you seem to think that. Uh, people seem to assume that they would have had full control instead of remembering that it was a two-thirds majority coalition to the Tories. Yeah. So that, you know, if, if the Tories didn't want something, there was no way they could force it. Yeah, but they it could was... have had a voting record that said they voted get they, they brought it up and that it was voted down. Yeah, uh, I'm not, I'm not I mean... saying that they didn't do a good enough job of making it transparent um, to do that, but you know, other governments have done worse things and been forgiven for begin, been forgiven for it. I think my we... point is right yeah. that the Labour government, Blair's Labour government, brought in the tuition fees. The, the Tory government increased them. Mm. My, in my eyes, that's the, the fault. There lies squarely on Labour and Tory. Mm. Oh yeah. But, you know, so I think this country just needs an entirely new political party. Mm. You know, just, I, just, it's not that expensive to set one up. I wouldn't be surprised if when the next general election rolls around, the Green Party and the Liberal Democrats and maybe some other smaller, um, more liberal parties just say look for the good of the country we're forming a coalition party yeah and we're going to stand for government just I mean, in the same way that the liberal democrats was born from the liberal party and the um SDP. i can't remember what they were yeah the sdp mm. social democrat pie um and I reckon if they did that, I reckon they'd, they'd have a really good shot at winning. Mm. Because this, uh, there's at least, right? And I know we're getting onto, we're getting onto specifically UK politics here. Um, and I'll draw that back in, I'll draw it all back in a moment. But I just want to say this is that the 48% who voted to not leave, um, are still not happy about everything, understandably, and I'm one of them. Yeah, I'm fucking living. Feel too. feel betrayed by Theresa May. Feel betrayed by Jeremy Corbyn. Feel betrayed by Tory and Labour. I've seen so many people who are staunch Tories, staunch um, Labour supporters. I was saying, I'm gone. I'm out of Tory and Labour. I'm going Lib Dem or I'm going Green. Mm. You know, high-ranking members. You know, and... 
it, it's it's kind of it's it's weird how it's getting like that now. Mm. That you know, it, it's it's almost like we're having a sort of liberal right war at the moment, ideological war, war for lack of a better term, because there's no actual there's no actual full on actual violent war taking place. It's all talking mm. and stuff. And nobody seems to be all that interested in fixing, you know, the major parties that, in, in just going, right, this shit ain't working. We need to streamline no. the whole process of government. Yeah, the only people who are interested in fixing it are the smaller parties. Mm. But the problem with the, with the idea of a coalition is that they'll be pulling at each other. What you'd need to do is say, right, we need to scrap the Green Party, the SDP, the Lib Dems, we need to and just start a new core. Sorry, party. yeah, that, that's what I that's what I meant. Sorry, that's what yeah. I meant. They, they, would, they would do that. They would just say, right, we're, like like where where the the Liberal Party and the SDP just join together to become one mm. party. And you know, I if I was in that, I would I would start putting things like you know, force through things like the idea of none of the above as a voting mm. option. Well, we should be if if because too often people make an either or choice of Labour and Conservative. We should, in my mm. opinion, it should be well, not even that. You should you should have that option, but I would um, push for scrapping first past the post. Yeah, just move it and replacing it proportional replacing representation. It, either replacing it with proportional representation or some other form of. Um, Alternative slash single transferable vote, mm. and an agreement or multiple if, if, transferable vote. If you do have a referendum, it needs to be a clear majority. Yeah, that's another mm. thing. Yeah, referendums cannot be won on yeah. a simple majority; it has to be a clear majority, like seventy-five percent. Yeah, exactly. Or more for for really important shit. So when you've got something like Brexit, you have to have an absolute majority, an unassailable mark. Not just fifty-one percent, forty-eight point five, and also a, a, a majority of people turning out to actually fucking vote. Yeah, yeah. So if only fifty percent of the population turn out, it's scrapped. Yeah, and educate children about politics. That's important as well. Turn That's the fuck be done. up. That should be done. You know, turn the fuck up, and just like actually vote. I, 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 I'm in two minds, right? About making voting a requirement because part of me thinks that it should be something that you should feel that you have to do like I do, I feel that it's important to vote Mm. whether I I vote for an actual party or I spoil my ballot that's up to me Mm. but every time a vote is up I vote I exercise that because I feel it's a a duty of being a citizen of this co- of, of yeah. the United Kingdom that I should and I that I owe it to myself and I owe it to everyone in, in the United Kingdom to vote. I rem- I remember having a conversation with a woman from Germany. Um, mm-hmm. It was before. Uh, so when was Thatcher elected? Seventy nine. Yeah. And then that would be in eighty three, eighty seven. So in nineteen eighty seven, I was. Um, still with my first girlfriend and I was chatting to the partner of her dad and this one was like so how will you vote because and it was sort of like well you know I don't really follow any political party because I didn't regard any of them having lived through the, the disasters of like both of them mm-hmm. I didn't feel either of the main parties deserve my vote and it was coming yeah. up to my first ever I was 18 or so so it was coming up to my first chance to vote um, I don't think I was eligible to vote in the 87 election. I'd have only been 16, so I didn't get to vote then. Um, but when I said I was uninterested and I wasn't politically active, this woman was horrified. And I explained that you couldn't vote till you were 18. And she said, well, that's still no excuse because you're going to have to live with the decisions that are made as a result of this election. That you don't even discuss it is a bit of a problem. Mm-hmm. You know, and if and are you not a member of your local youth party or anything like that? And I said, no, we don't have those really. You don't, really, you know, the only people that would join Young Labour or Young the Young Conservatives were kind of sort of middle and upper class people. So working class people don't join any kind of thing, but really before they're eighteen, and then only a few of them join after they're eighteen. And she was horrified. 
Because in Germany, you have all the parties have a, a youth section, and all the parties hold youth elections for their officers, mm-hmm. and various of their officers get to give speech on the young person's perspective of what their party is thinking about doing. So, you know, children are involved in politics in a lot of the rest of Europe. Yeah. Which is why, you know, shit like that don't go down all that well. You know, if, if there is a, sh- a change in politics, young people are involved in Europe a lot more. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that's part of who, you know, you know, and we're losing that because we're coming out of Europe and we're going to lose that perspective. You know, generally speaking, by the time the the average European, mainland European kid gets to 18, they've got some political opinions. Now, whether that's mm-hmm. conservative or what we would call left-leaning is down to them, but they at least are aware of the whole process and what is expected of them. Yeah. I mean, if you've been in a country that's been under fascist occupation like Spain, France, Germany, Italy, you know, all the sort of like the G10 countries in Europe, you're very aware of what fucking up an election can do to your country. Yeah. Well, and the your your parents be... and grandparents properly know that it was a bad fucking deal. And Eastern Europe's the same, you know, Eastern European yeah. kids get involved in it because they've been under the boot heel of um, Russian communism for all that time. Is um, Afghanistan's in Eastern Europe, isn't it? Well, Afghanistan's the Middle East, so that's, you know... Okay, yeah, well, um, yeah. Afghanistan had a very... Had, um, a communist occupation for a while and that was really bad for them yeah and they understand that how, well I mean they've got a western occupation now mm. you know it's fast becoming our, Viet- our Vietnam as well as it was the Russians Vietnam yeah. we didn't learn from Vietnam that we you know just leave other countries the fuck alone and that goes on to the wider point of if you produce everything in country that you need you don't feel you know you don't feel the urge to support businesses when they say oh our oil imports are being hurt Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know. Did we discuss it on air, or we, you know, the Germans with solar power and stuff like that? They were basically giving electricity away and paying we did, people we to use it. So you know, in Germany, they, they're they're pretty energy self sufficient at the moment, and that makes them you know strong. Yeah. You know, being a bully and an arsehole to like oil producing countries doesn't make you strong. It just makes you a bully and an arsehole. Mm-hmm. How about how about we learn not to deal with stuff? I mean, sunlight falling out of the sky and water power and wind turbines and shit. You can put them anywhere. That means you don't have to bully little oil producing countries all the fucking time, and you don't get pushed around by businesses that say, unless you support us in this, uh, you know, in in our endeavours in oil producing countries, you're going to suffer energy wise for it. The cost of oil yeah. will go up. The cost of things will go up. We've already produ- we're already producing plastics that are based on potato starch. Mm-hmm. We we have that. That's what PLA printers use in 3D yeah. printing. That's vegetable starch. It's biodegradable. You can just grow more vegetables and make more of it. You don't have to wait, you know, a couple of million years for it to be crushed into oil. Yeah. We don't need oil for plastics anymore. We don't need oil for plastics anymore. We don't need oil for power. We have yeah, electric we need... cars. They they're there. The Tesla is yeah. an electric car. We can generate electricity. You know, we might need a bit of oil for lubrication and manufacturing and shit like that, but we don't need the amount that, you know, huge mega corporations are telling us we need. Yeah. And America produces 50% of its own oil now. Mm. Imports have only just gone up to 51%, and they're the people kicking over the ant's nest in the Middle East. Yeah. I think one of the things I just want to touch on real quickly is that Mm. You make one of your things you said earlier might make us sound nationalist, and we're not. We're 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 pro Europe. Oh yeah, you absolutely, know, definitely. But what but you I'm said really earlier about a country being able to look after itself for all its needs. Well, yes. Well, this that is, means this is you don't I'm have just, to hassle anybody else. This is what I was just going to get onto, right? We were in Europe. We were in the European Union when we were a self-sufficient country. We're in there for a good few years. When we stopped being a self-sufficient country, we were still in Europe. But that wasn't the fault of Europe. That was Thatcher's fault. She stopped the majority of our homegrown industries. 
There we've got no car industry, we've got no steel industry, we've got no air... We, we can't produce our own aircraft anymore, I don't think. Mm. We can't make our own tanks, we can't um, produce our own energy, despite the fact it's falling out of the fucking sky. Yeah, we, we've had the... the I mean, governments have been taking things away from us. Oh, did you see that thing last year where Scotland... It was only for one day... But Scotland mm -hmm. was energy self-sufficient for a day. It was so windy. Oh, that's pretty cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. So it, and they haven't got, you know, it's not like when you go to Scotland, you can't move for fucking wind turbines. They haven't got that many, but it mm -hmm. was just a windy day and all their electricity was taken care of by wind power. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that you could switch off the oil to Scotland and shit like that. That means that there is the potential there for manning the national grid. And, um... Tesla, what's his name? What's the Tesla guy's name? Um, Elon Musk. Elon Musk um, has started to properly produce the wall of power. I don't know, yeah. power walls? Power you see wall. where you can just like replace a wall in your house and it'll have enough battery power in it so that when you've got solar or wind power, if it's generating enough during the day, it will be enough to run a normal house, as in with a washing machine, multiple televisions, multiple computers, all the lights on, it will run it. Yeah, I... I... My what I would like to see from an energy strategy is um, lots and lots of micro generation. Yeah, at the end of your street, um, you know. sort of like be it be it individual homes or little little community substate little community small power stations. Yeah, you know because you know solar panels on everyone's roofs helps. Wind turbines and everyone, uh, everyone's prop roofs helps. Um, well, do you know? Back to, do you know much, of storage? You know, you know those Sorry. little boat wind turbines. How much? Four hundred watts. Yeah. Twenty four seven. So if you have, so every every two and a half hours, that's a kilowatt. Yeah. So and that's twenty four seven all day, especially in a windy country like Britain. Yeah. The only. The only things, right, that we need a grid for, right, are the things that use a lot of power all the time. Transport. Transport, data storage, um, and utilities or services. So we're looking, we're looking at the rail industry, the bus industry, and the air industry, air travel industry. So those mm. those transports. We're looking at data centers and businesses need that set power all the time, but they can offset that with they can offset that with uh, solar and wind themselves. Big industry that requires power to run machinery and services, police, fire, NHS. Yeah, those are the only things that actually need to have a national grid. Now, if you reduce, if if we can get, if you get micro generation up everywhere, say everybody's house has solar, right? Yeah. Every little town has takes advantage of some natural resource if they can. You know, some cities might not be able to because they're too built up, but every place takes advantage of the natural resources they can. If a if a town is right next to a really powerful river. You know, where in the in the past they may have used a water mill, the amount of a water mill for milling things. You put a um, a small hydro unit there. Um, then once you've done that, you can think about okay, well, we can get rid of all the coal power stations and all the oil power stations and all the gas power stations and the nuclear ones that we've got. We can just keep those. We don't need to build any more. Hmm. Because they're just going to last forever. But you could do things like put a couple of macerator turbines in your waste outlet pipe. Yeah, well, even that. You know, just bladed turbines that actually will charge things up. Mm. Just just from the downward the downward motion of your waste water. The city in which I live, right, um, has a, an incinerator plant. The, and this is how they deal with their rubbish. They incinerate tr rubbish. I bet it and, generates power. Yeah, that's it. It generate. That's what it does. They burn the trash and use that 
to generate power for the city. So that's 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 an example of how a city can do micro generation yeah. by burning the city's trash. Because you've got you've got a guaranteed fuel, fuel source every yeah. single day. Every oh, yeah. single day you've got trash tons and coming tons in. Of it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm and gonna, you can, I'm, yeah. Sorry, after you can't finish what you're saying. No, I've, I've finished. Oh, okay. So yeah, that's that. We di we we digressed a bit. We've got to sort of wrap we it did up. Just I've, I've yeah, got no. to head off to work shortly. Um, yeah. So I'm just gonna. Do you, I'll do the recommendia, and do you want to do the links? Yeah, sure. Okay. So um, I found a YouTube channel by a guy called Garrett. G a w r e double t. Oh, Garrett's fantastic. Oh. Love his videos. Holy shit, that guy's good. That's an intelligent, research-worthy sort of a dude. So he go. He talks a lot on feminism, misogyny, and and trans issues and stuff like that, and all the uh, men's rights activists. Oh, I hate that phrase. Um, MRA on YouTube, but he, he does he does a Mid really cow. fantastic job of it, and I I can't recommend him enough. Um, mm. Also, in the running order, there's a link to um, the Crass documentary, which is a punk band that was into anarchy and is still practicing anarchy. Um, in a very interesting way. That's uh, it's, uh, the documentary is called "There Is No Authority But Yourself," mm -hmm. and a documentary about the Dead Kennedys called "Fresh Fruit for Rotting Eyeballs," which is the name of their first album. And that's worth watching because they were a very interesting, very political band. And I'd have to say, "Eye Boy," which has just come out on Netflix and is out there on the interwebs, and is a Netflix original movie, and is kind of like a really interesting sci-fi yeah. novel uh, sort of movie. And I, I recommend. It. I watched it last night. I was, I was apps. I thought it was going to be really crap, which I should have known better because it is a Netflix sponsored thing. Mm -hmm. But it's, a, it's a London-based sci-fi thing set in the modern day, which is very interesting. And over to you with the links. Okay, so we've got um, a link provided to us. One of the first one provided to us by Digital Whiskey: uh, Future Desalination, mm -hmm. the future of desalination in Russia. And uh, homemadetools.net, uh, a site with homemade tools. That's really interesting. I haven't had a chance to actually really go into that, but the idea of sort of being able to manufacture your own kit is always cool. And these people have made power tools out of other power tools and shit like that, and workbenches and things. So, mm. yeah. There's a, um, a link to a Fortune article about um, desalination, a scalable desalination project. Um, can um, I just butt in there as well? Yeah. This guy, um, Manoj Bhagat. Bargavra, 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 really interesting guy. Really, it's like an like an Indian Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. Really, really interesting. He's come up with some Bagava. really fantastic fucking innovations. Well worth checking out the other stuff that he's done as well. But that's the desalination that's the size of a of a pickup truck. Yeah, I, mean, I hear you mentioned so, about that. It's that does about five hundred liters an hour. Mm -hmm. So a farm needs one of them, kinda. You know, to, to irrigate, like, you know, an average sort of village farm can use one and get enough drinking water straight out of it. This thing is tiny compared to a normal desalination plant. And his idea was to put, like, hundreds of them on barges. Because we're never going to be able to use the ocean dry. Because essentially, when you put water into the earth, it evaporates eventually and goes back into the ocean. So we really have be having to go some to drain, you know, to even lower the ocean's levels. And the fact that we've got global warming... You know, we could use the drop in the ocean level, anything that we could get, really. So that's mm -hmm. so it's a total win. Anyway, sorry, carry on. There's a uh, link from the Tree Hugger, triggerhugger.com, about um, permaculture greens in the Jordanian desert. Oh, I got a button on that one. Jordanians, well. sorry. Yeah. Go on. Um, <clears throat> um, I think perhaps you should have done the links. <laughs> I should have done the links. Yeah, I am sorry. Um, the. The reason there's a, there's a thing on that after that, which is an aggravating story about permaculture, is because they sorted out 65 acres of desert and turned it into a lush farm just by growing the right plants. So they turned desert, utterly useless and will kill you, into farmland mm -hmm. and then fucked off home uh, without explaining properly to the Jordanians how to maintain it. Oh my gosh. That's the white, white, priv white privilege on a colossal scale. Oh my oh, gosh! Which, what we, we couldn't seem to explain to the Jordanians why, why, uh, how to maintain it. You fuckers! Then you're doing then you it wrong. Then you stay until you have. That's what you do. Sixty-five acres they did in two years, with about ah. with about thirty people, and then let it die. 
and tur it turned back into desert because the white people weren't running it anymore. That's just that's just doing doing half the job. Yep, that's why it's important. That's a really good link, and uh, it's a very short article, but there are there are there are onward places to read. But um, it was the thing that Frank Herbert was into, the guy that wrote yeah. Dune. He had a he had a like a two hundred and sixty acre ranch, and he was trying to turn desert into usable land because we're only making bigger deserts. We're not going to run out of desert anytime soon. Never going to. Well, happen. that was that was one of the things that happens in Dune, doesn't it? Yes. Uh, originally, it's a lush planet, and they find out about the spice, and they let the planet go to seed so they can make the spice and fuck everybody over. But they, they, they make Dune. it a lush planet again, don't they? Yeah, and then they turn it back using uh, ecology. So he was very yeah. into that, and that's because it like, really echoes the kind of we could have made Jordan a completely self-sufficient, happy country full of well-fed people that were well-educated and shit. But no, because white people couldn't be in charge, we let it all fucking turn back, and then blame stupid natives. You, you're telling me that if explained in the right way, those people that were living in Jordan wouldn't want to be able to turn desert at will over a period of years into arable farmland? Yeah. Fuck off fuck off were they were they not capable of understanding it you you explained it like white people you couldn't find like someone else to explain it on your behalf when you went bastards mm -hmm. that's like showing showing someone you know a kid you know a whole box of sweeties and then taking them away again that's just that's wanker behavior anyway sorry carry on <laughs> and last uh, link here is a uh, uh, link to bizarre labs and it's about foxhole radios yep uh, it's essentially crystal radio sets Nice. Which is real interesting. I would love to build, like, an, I'd love to c convert Morse into data. Oh, yeah. To, you know, to be able to send, because you can send Morse around the world with no power. Yeah. You know, like, you know, about sort of 100 watts and uh, an 80 meter antenna in the right place. Mm -hmm. Which doesn't have to be all in a straight line. Or it doesn't have to be the whole of 80 minutes, it just has to be a fraction of that. But you could transmit data as, uh, and I think that's where we need to go. Yeah. To provide free, it would be slow as anything until you got the data transmission. But if you consider that we were able to transmit on cassette audio data is back in the 80s with Spectrum cassettes and, and C64 cassettes, yeah, we, we could do the same thing. That was, It would be totally fucking unstoppable. It'd just be a radio signal. And anybody that was capable of building a foxhole radio and a computer interface, you could send it in type. You could type out the, the data and it would mm -hmm. get to anybody in the world that could build a foxhole radio and have some means of translating it. Ideally on a mobile phone. Yeah. That would be fairly awesome. If you could plug in a Morse receiver into a mobile phone and have it decode the Morse for you. That would be pretty cool, yeah. Yeah. So I thought that would be interesting and it's something for the for the smarter people out there to do. Because I, I literally look at technology and go, this is how we could use that, but somebody will need to build it because I don't understand any of that shit. But yeah. But uh, yeah, that's uh, some interesting stuff. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the show. We're kind of wrapped up here. It's going to be about two and a half hours now. Yeah. Wow. Maybe, getting, maybe more. Longer. Two hours. Yeah. So, we're, so if we do go on Patreon, we're just becoming better and better value for your entertainment needs. <laughs> so yeah and the outro is a song called H by the again by the American Any Men and Lees and from the same new EP that was uh, released by uh, uh, Shameless Promotion and that's new out and if you go along to Shameless Promotion I'm sure they'll uh, they've got a, a thingy there and uh, yeah that's it and uh, our intro and outro are under 8 seconds so both of them so that shouldn't cause uh, YouTube to have a meltdown our uh, um, copyright protection thing is now back to a smiley face so we're not imposing on that cool. and it was both from the, the film 300 I especially like the uh, give them nothing take from them everything <laughs> it's my favourite line in that whole movie and especially since gay men are fighting um, the, uh, the Xerxes yep it's the, the army of mandatorily gay men fighting and fighting people. But do you know what? The, the weird thing is that they make out the Athenians are, are homosexual in that. Yeah. Yeah, you just literally type in Spartan society and see what comes back. Yeah. They were all a bit swishy. So, gay men taking over their part of the world. So, it, was kind of, it wasn't a fun society, though. I mean, there was a lot of slavery and shit, but, you know. And it wasn't like, you know... It, it, it was an option to be gay in the Spartan army. It was kind of like, you know, mandatory. Yes. Anyway, <laughs> so not maybe the best example, but an interesting bunch of people nonetheless. 
Anyway, so that about wraps up the show. Uh, yeah, we're going to be on two and a half to somewhere between two, two, thir- two and a half and two hours 45 for this show. Wow. So yeah, cool. So we had good news. And if you want to be on the show, we've mentioned all the ways to get in touch, but do drop into the IRC because I, I want to, I, I want loads of people in the IRC. And if you're out there and you're listening to this, well, cool. Thank you very much for listening to the show. We appreciate it. And uh, please keep listening and do contact us. Get, you know, be, be part of it. Yeah, definitely get in touch, dudes. Yeah. Be great, yeah. folks. Definitely get in touch, folks. Not dudes or guys. Yep. I correct people. myself, folks. Yeah. Hang it. Join the tribe. Damn right. And the more people, we can do more stuff. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's brilliant. Thank you very much to Graffin for being on the show again. And Thanks uh, very much, V. We'll get a new show out to you within the next week. Yep. Stay smart.
my socks take a shot in my arm Once a day, every dark morning Pull up my socks, take a shot in my arm Once a day, every dark morning Pull up my socks, take a shot in my arm What was that? That's the finale. <laughs>